When I was 11, my dad, my sister, and I moved into a townhouse. At night, I would wake up and see two different men, they were different every night, walk into my room. My room was right next to the bathroom, which is where the two men would walk in from. One would have a top hat and a tailcoat. The other wore dark sunglasses and a trench coat, but the silhouettes would change. It would creep me out so much that I would hide under my covers. Sometimes I got too scared and slept in my dad's bed. One night I was sleeping in my dad's room and two identical twin girls with long black hair and hollowed out eyes came up to my dad while he slept. They didn't say anything, they just stared at him and then they went away. Our neighbor John told me that I could see ghosts. I've been told I'm a medium, but I block it out as an adult. I'm 20 now. In John's house, I saw a woman hanging by the neck in his kitchen, and then in the basement, a man with a cleaver dripping in blood. I was so scared that I left. Now I'm 20, and I still believe in ghosts. People tell me that I should develop my gift, but... I don't know if I want to develop it any more than it already has. I'm currently 17, and I believe this first encounter took place when I was 13 to 15. It happened sometime in between 8th and 9th grade where I'm from. I remember it clearly. I was just waking up from a nap in my dad's room and looked out his window at our front lawn and street. It was the middle of a clear and sunny day, so there's no way it was just the shadow of a cloud. On the other side of our street a man was jogging, except nobody was there. It was like a shadow of somebody. Like I'm sure you all know how shadows stretch and shrink depending on where the light's coming from, right? But this shadow didn't. It was as if there was an invisible wall there and a person in front of it. Except there wasn't. It was the perfect outline of a man. I could see straight through it and whatever it jogged by was changed to the mutish gray color that the shadows are. I saw my neighbor's lawn, a tree, the bottom of my neighbor's fence, and many other things, as this thing passed it. I rubbed my eyes a few times just to see if maybe I was seeing something weird or had film on my eyes or something, but no, this weird shadow guy was there, just taking a leisurely jog through the neighborhood. I watched him for a while, completely bewildered. The weird shadow guy didn't really move in regular time. It was almost like he was jogging in slow motion. He would bound up kind of slowly and then come back down just as slowly. Almost like gravity affected him indifferently. Or not at all. After that, I went out to my living room to check if I was just seeing things or maybe there was something on the window. But nope. The guy was still there. Or the shadow was still jogging at the same pace. That's all that really happened the first time I saw him. The second time, it was a bit more interesting. I'm not too sure how old I was the second time I saw the shadow guy, but it was a similar situation. I was waking up from a nap in my living room and happened to look out our large rectangular window, which looks out onto the front lawn and street. There he was again still at the same pace, with the same figure, translucency, and color. This time, I made the mistake of going over to my door and opening it to get a better look at him. I took a step out onto my front step and immediately realized I had made a mistake. He slowly turned toward me and began jogging at me at the same pace in my direction. 
Almost instantly, I got an uneasy and scared feeling in my stomach, went back inside and closed the door. He turned back to the direction he'd been going in before and continued at the same pace down the street. Afterward, I could feel my heart beating in my chest and I was breathing heavily. I'm not too sure what would have happened if I had stayed outside, but believe me when I say I'm glad I didn't stick around to find out. I'm sure it wouldn't have been good. I did a little bit of digging on my area, Ellicott City, and I couldn't find anything on people that had died while jogging in and around my neighborhood, so I'm stumped. I do remember something I read in a book one time, though. Keep in mind, it definitely wasn't a non-fiction book, as when I did read for fun, I wasn't really into those. What it was called, I can't quite remember, but I do recall the description of it. It was something about shadows and spirits that walk down streets and roads. If you're on the road with it, you're supposed to either cross the street to the other side, or run away from it, but I can't remember which. If you let it run through you, it's supposed to steal your soul or something like that. Whether that's an actual description of something or just something made up that was in a book, I don't know. But I thought it was weird how it almost perfectly described what I'd seen. Like, it was almost too similar to just be a coincidence, but I don't know. Since the second sighting, I haven't witnessed him. But I have seen something else. My house was built in 1963, and before we moved in, I heard from my mom that an old couple had lived in the house and that one of them had died inside. There are a lot of things that have happened to my sister and I that could be considered paranormal, but I'll just describe the few that I remember the most clearly. It was the middle of the night and I had woken up for whatever reason. For less than a second, I saw an old lady. The lady was sort of hunched forward and facing away from me. She turned in my direction very quickly, before disappearing completely. She had white hair in patches, was very skinny, and was decomposing in several places, so much so that I could see bone. But her most prominent feature was her jaw. It was detached from one side of her face and hanging off the other. Despite her mouth and face decomposing to the point where discolored flesh was hanging off her face, her teeth were perfectly white and intact. After that, I just lay awake for a while staring at where she'd just been. Nothing. I thought I saw an outline, but I wasn't too sure. That was all I saw of her. I haven't seen her since that time, but I still think about it every now and then. It was definitely weird. This next one is actually kind of funny. It's in the same house, but this time I was in my room at night. I was awake and on my phone, and the door was open a crack. All of a sudden, it opens all the way, kind of slowly, and hits my wall. From the hallway, I hear footsteps walk up to my bed and turn around, but nothing is there. All I say is, why you gotta creep me out like that? It's not cool. And I heard footsteps leave the room and the door closed. It happened a few more times, but at differing points in the day, before I realized that all of these incidents had a commonality. My door was either open a crack or all the way, and everyone had to be asleep or I had to be home alone. So I started closing my door all the way, and it stopped. I haven't really heard from this thing since, so I hope whatever it was found its peace. At least this one was a pretty chill ghost. I talked to my sister about it. She says that some similarly weird stuff has happened to her since we moved in as well. This one actually happened this morning, right after I woke up. I kept trying to close my eyes to go back to sleep, but I kept hearing a tapping on my pillow. I couldn't feel it but I heard it every single time I closed my eyes. It continued until my mom came in and opened my door to let me know she was going somewhere. After that, the tapping stopped. So if I'm not crazy, either there's a new ghost or spirit that came in after one of my parents opened my door to check on me during the night, 
Or it's the same one and it just got stuck after coming in during the same occurrence. If it's the same one, I'm really sorry it hasn't found its peace yet. If it's a new one, well, hope you like my house, I guess. Last fall, my mom was not doing so well, and it looked like she might not make it. So my wife and I traveled back to my hometown, just in case this was goodbye. We stayed at a pretty sketchy hotel while we were there because not much else was open. After coming back to the hotel for the night, we noticed that our dog didn't come to the door to greet us, which was strange. We called her and called her, and nothing. My wife then saw that the bathroom door was closed. She opened it and came upon our dog in a little nest of towels, happily laying there without a care in the world. It was odd because our dog has horrible separation issues. Fast forward to the middle of the night, we were woken up by the bathroom door opening and repeatedly closing, all on its own with no cause whatsoever at least not a natural one. Once we were home, things seemed to get back to normal. However, one day my wife was sleeping in our room and I was in the living room with the dog. The bedroom door was closed. I noticed that the door to the bedroom was opening with no one being there to open it. It had been closed securely. I had even heard the click sound that it makes when it closes all the way, and I did so intentionally to give my wife quiet while she slept. Since coming home, things are pretty standard, other than the fact that our dog will now stare for prolonged periods of time down the hallway, toward our laundry room, at seemingly nothing. Electronics have started to turn themselves on and off. The fan beside me, for example, has now become known for just turning on, never off though, all on its own. So has the TV, the Apple HomePod, pretty much everything. The Apple HomePod will suddenly answer unheard questions at times of total quiet, even when no other TV or other noise sources are available. It's so strange. I think something might have followed us home. This is something that happened to a friend's brother, and a lot of people say that this town he lived in, which is called Bor in my country of Serbia, is filled with black magic, and generally not so many good things. When he started high school, he moved to Bor and stayed at some student dorms. He had a friend that had this girl that was basically stalking him. She wasn't very attractive, so he just dismissed her, and he'd often joke around about how ugly she was. My friend used to visit his brother in Bor, so he was very aware of this stalker girl. He visited him about once a month. The next time he came, though, the guy was in love with the stalker girl. She would piggyback him and run through the halls and engage in behavior that was pretty abnormal for the guy. My friend naturally asked the guy why he was with this girl, especially when he'd said she was so ugly. This guy picked up my friend by his throat, threatening him saying that if he ever said anything bad about her, he'd kill him. He asked his brother what had happened to the guy, and his brother told him that this girl did black magic on him. Apparently they found some weird stuff under the guy's pillow, but he wouldn't listen to any of them. So the brother, being fed up with the things going on in the dorms, decided to rent a house out with his best friend while he was there. He told me a lot of creepy stories about that town, but this was one of the creepiest. He said that they were at a student party and were walking back home. He and his friend had to pass this park. Through the middle of the park were these stairs. They had to pass them to get back home, and they were a really long set of stairs. So after the party, maybe two to three in the morning, they're walking past those stairs. 
and I see a really old woman slowly walking up the stairs holding both of the rails. They consult each other as to what they should do, if they should help her. But knowing the parts they were in and considering the time, they decided to cautiously walk past her. The brother's friend was the first one to walk past her, and as soon as he did, he just starts bolting up the stairs like his life depended on it. The brother, now reasonably scared, walked past the granny, and he said that the granny looked straight into his eyes, with hollow eyes, and he said she was crying blood. He said he ran so fast he overtook his friend and never looked back. There are a lot of tales of folklore from that town, and knowing them I'm not surprised at what the people who live there tell me. As a kid, I grew up in the country, and I was pretty much surrounded by the woods. I had some paranormal experiences that I can't explain in those woods, and the house. I was 15, I decided to go hiking in the woods on a bright summer day. It was hot out, but being in the woods I found plenty of shade. I got lost in my own angsty teen thoughts. I don't remember what I was thinking about, but... It must have been about how city kids have fun, or boobs. It could have been either. It was probably boobs. I snapped out of it and realized I was in grass and brush that was literally over my head, and I couldn't tell where I was. I had never been in that part of the forest before, and as I looked around for anything to tell me where I was, I found nothing. For example, the stone wall that was in the eastern side of the woods, the creek that lay in a ravine to the north, or the cornfield to the west. But all I saw were trees and thick brush. When you trample through brush, you normally can see the path you took in. But oddly, there was no such path. I calmed myself and thought of what to do. I decided to head east because the stone wall lined most of the eastern side. If I could find it, then I would be able to follow it down to a lower field and find my way back. Instead, I ended up finding the ravine that led down to the creek. But the stage, it was an old wooden structure that looked like a stage, so that's what we called it, and the field that it was in were nowhere in sight. I thought a bit that if I followed the ravine west, I would find it. That lasted ten feet when I found a really large wall of thorn bushes. South was many trees, north was the ravine with the creek blocked by thorn bushes. I'm turned around. Obviously you've noticed that I'm not sure which is south at this point, or north, but I'm telling it from the way I was facing when I heard it. It was faint at first, but it was clear what it was the sound of drums, beating steadily, as though there were a drum circle behind me in the woods. I figured it was someone out in the woods who, one, would kill me, two, would give me weed, or three, would help me out of the woods. So, being lost, I headed towards the sound. As I walked to the sound, it didn't get louder or fainter. It was steady. I just kept walking. As I walked, the beat became more distinct. Definitely a hand drum, not a drumstick. Not a big drum, but more like bongos. I followed the sound until I heard it fade, and then I heard dogs barking. It was at that point I realized where I was. It was a place that I was familiar with. I heard the drums a couple of more times when I was in the woods, but I never figured out where they came from. At one point, I was walking with my cousin, and we both heard it. We swore that it came from deeper in the woods, but we weren't sure who was doing it or why. Now the fun part. I live 18 miles away from that part of the forest, but I'm at the other end of it now. The same forest travels that far. Same forest, different location. 
Tonight, what made me decide to tell this story was I was out smoking a cigarette. I stood at the banks of the river that separated the forest from the yard I have, and all of a sudden in the darkness, I could hear the sound of drumming over the hill. It didn't scare me. It brought a smile to my face. So this happened when I was 18. I lived with my parents in a sleepy suburb outside of DC. It's a big three-story house with a left side deck, and the basement outside door is beneath the deck. Going underneath the deck is a granite rock staircase out to our backyard, which is a steep 30 degree slope down a peppy little creek. Now that that's out of the way, it's the summer of my senior year. My parents are out of town for a week. I leave the Marine Corps in a few months, so naturally I throw a rager. The party was pretty rad. A metal band showed up at some point. Many a gallon of swill was ingested, and it went on late into the night. At around three, there were a few of us left, just hanging out and shooting the shit. Eventually, everyone falls asleep, except for me and my two friends, Heather and Amber. So we go out on the deck, which overlooks the hill and my neighbor's yard, separated from ours by a wooden fence roughly three feet high. They have a rock garden that's tiered with about two feet drop downs for about 20 total feet, with a nice pagoda in the middle. They also have a weeping angel style three foot tall statue overlooking the hill a few feet away from the fence. Anyway, we're out there getting lung cancer, smoking, and we keep hearing these footsteps coming up the rock path. It's pitch black, so we can't see who's coming up, and I didn't want to turn on the floodlights because I'm worried I'll wake the neighbors. I whisper down, drive safe, thinking it's someone leaving the party. The footsteps abruptly stop, and I jokingly call out, good night to you too. Around a minute or so passes and we start getting weirded out, wondering what the fuck that person is doing there, just standing. Amber yells out, are you okay? No response. So I go inside and grab a flashlight quickly and shine in below the deck to see what the matter is. There's nobody there. I ask Heather and Amber if they heard them walk off and they assured me that they hadn't. This is when Heather notices the statue. I said it was pointed down the hill. Well, it's now turned noticeably toward us. Not facing us, but it's clearly been moved. We get real quiet, light up another cigarette, and start talking about how strange all of this is. Now, I spent eight years in the Corps, and I've seen plenty of funny, creepy, and weird shit since then. But I've never seen anything like I did that night. As we're looking at the statue, it fucking gets turned facing us even more. We all see it, and we start freaking out. Not quietly, I say, what the? And right as I do, we hear loud footsteps on the rock stairs again. Heavy, fast, moving steps. I quickly shine my light down there. For the second time, there's nothing. I shine it over to the statue, and I swear it's been moved another 90 degrees. We then hear squishing, crunching footsteps coming from by the statue. We had a little garden area, maybe eight feet or so, in between the stairs and the neighbor's fence. That's where the footstep sounds are coming from. At this point, we're all scared, but being a guy, and Heather and Amber both being attractive, I exclaim that I'm going to go investigate, to try to calm them down. They say they'll follow right behind me, not wanting to be alone. So we go out the front door and slowly creep our way down the steps. Before we round the corner of the house, we hear the footsteps again, beating feet away from us down the hill. Mind you, there's nowhere to go down there, just fifty or so acres of woods and the creek our house being on the ass end of the cul-de-sac. 
We get to the spot where we heard the crunching and I shine my light down the hill. Nothing but the trees and their shadows. I shine my light to the fence and the statue is now facing us completely. I start to walk over to the fence, shining my light down so I don't trip. And Heather says, wait, look. I look down and see several massive boot prints. Think shack size shoes. They go toward the statue and stop. One of the prints was made around the fucking fence post, like something had stepped through it. Listen, my balls are only so big, so I say run, and we take off back inside and rush upstairs and into my bed, thoroughly freaked out. We stayed there for about 30 minutes, trying to think of how any of that was possible. Nothing came to mind then, and nothing does now. After about another 10 minutes or so, I realized that I didn't lock the door. So I go back downstairs into the front door. As I lock it and turn around, I hear a fairly loud bang on the deck, like someone or something hit one of the support columns. I promptly decide fuck the neighbors and turn on all of the floodlights and run back upstairs. We stayed up until the sun began peeking through the trees, talking about what the fuck just happened. It was seriously terrifying. That's the end of that night. The statue was back to its normal place when we went to look in the morning sun, and the footprints were gone. I never had anything else happen in that house. My parents still live there and have never mentioned anything. But to this day, it remains one of the creepiest paranormal events I've ever witnessed. Have you ever heard of Great Wolf Lodge, the huge indoor water park packed with arcades, restaurants, and basically everything you could imagine? Well, I've been there twice, and the first time I had an experience that I wouldn't wish on anyone. I was there with my brother, my aunt and uncle, and my cousin. We got a room that came with the kid cabin. All that was in the kid cabin was a bunk bed, a small TV, a nightstand, and some cool paintings on the wall. The first night was fine. I slept on the top bunk, and Natalia, my cousin, slept on the bottom. The next day, my cousin begged to sleep on the bottom bunk again, so me, wanting the top bunk anyway, allowed it. I stayed up really late that night. I mean, not really, it was like 10.30, but being 7, I thought it was so cool. All I had for light was a small 3DS light. As I started to fall asleep and put down the game, I heard my cousin laughing. Well, more of a giggle. What's so funny? I asked, laughing a little myself. Stop, you're scaring me, she replied, her laughter fading a bit. Well, what? I responded, confused and a bit scared. How are you making that face? All of her laughter had poured out of that innocent seven-year-old's voice by now. I was rushing to turn on my 3DS for the light. I asked, what do you mean? I'm up here. She paused. Who is that? She said, realizing that whoever she was talking to wasn't me at all. She started to cry and call for me. The DS was still loading and by the time it turned on, she said that it was gone. The next day, I asked more about it. She said that there was a girl with black hair, bobbing up and down and smiling really big. To this day, it still scares me. I want to tell you about the times that I was mimicked, or at least the times that I encountered a mimic. The first one was actually a mimic of my sister. 
My other three siblings were at home and wanted to get takeout, so they called for my sister, who was not in the house at the time. She was outside with me. Now, I don't know if this is fake or not, but someone answered, or something did, and they said it sounded exactly like her. When the food came, they called for her again to get her stuff, but this time no one answered, so my brother took the pizza to her. He went inside the room just to find no one there. A dark, empty room. When they told me this, I could confirm that she was with me, but I didn't know whether to believe that something actually mimicked her or not. I thought they were just pulling our leg. The second time was a mimic of me, and I was scared out of my wits. My mother wanted to go out to the 7-Eleven store, and I was like, nope, not gonna happen, because it was really late at night. She ended up leaving anyway, and I was pretty upset, sulking in a corner. I was really scared because I had been watching too much Criminal Minds, and that shit makes you paranoid. So after her little run, she stood at the bus stop waiting for the bus. When she heard me behind her, she legit heard Mama in my voice. I was even more terrified when she told me, because again, it was my voice and I was clearly not behind her. I still didn't believe it though. But a lot of things have happened in my household, like some scary shit, and I guess this just adds to it. I still have a hard time believing it, but I don't know why my mother of all people would lie. Would you believe it? Or would you think it was nonsense? My family moved into a new house after my mom got remarried. The houses were built in the 50s, had only one or two previous owners to us. Upon moving in, we all experienced some strange things, wall sconces being lifted off the hook and thrown across the room, hearing sighs, voices, and general unease in certain parts of the house. There's no doubt that home was also home to a handful of spirits, however fairly benevolent. As time progressed, my at-the-time stepfather, who I'll call Larry, became increasingly hostile, angry, abusive, and altogether just incredibly nasty. It was known that he had various mental illnesses, including depression, bipolar disorder, and alcoholism. It was a slow progression with him, until the last few extremely bad years, as were the paranormal experiences. Looking back on our situation, there seemed to be an uncanny correlation between his anger and the spiritual turmoil. Many of the unsettling occurrences were directly related to him also. The first doppelganger experience that occurred was one morning when my father picked me up for his weekend visitation. About an hour after we left, my mom and Larry both heard my voice clearly calling Larry's name from outside. Only his name, which was unlike me because I never had a good relationship with him. They got up to inspect, and eventually called to ask just to find out that my dad and I were already in the other state that my dad lived in. The second was one super cold night, right after my younger sister was born. My mom had run out for some reason, and I was on the couch with Larry watching TV while he was feeding my newborn sister. My mother came inside to ask what Larry was doing out there, saying that she saw him kicking through the snow in his very distinct eagle's jacket. He disappeared behind the cars as my mom drove up the street, and she assumed that he had used a different door than the front to get back inside. But he was next to me the entire time she was gone. My mom has many stories about how their bed would vibrate and shake in the middle of the night and wake them up, but has a particularly unsettling middle of the night story. She was awake, but Larry was asleep. As she laid there, she says a black shadowy mass spilled into their room from under the door 
traveled up the wall and over the bed to above him, then completely disappeared. My younger sister says that she saw the exact same shadowy mass at his new apartment while visiting him after he and my mom split. Other than me, the rest of my family is incredibly religious, and they don't really believe in ghosts, so I don't know why they would make up stories like these if they didn't happen. The last few years of their marriage were the worst with his violence, anger, and volatility, as was the horrible, thick feeling of bad energy in the home. It became normal to us to hear things, see things fly off shelves and tables, and to feel absolutely terrified and nauseated to be in certain parts of the house. Since their divorce, we all moved out, and my mom has only experienced one possibly paranormal experience. She was laying on the couch at night, and I happened to be visiting. I was in my sister's room when we heard my mom yelling, Larry! Larry? Then flipping out and running into the room. She claimed to have seen him clear as day, leaning over her, and for a split second, she forgot they were even divorced and that he shouldn't have been there. She said he went into the kitchen, and she came running for us. But after a thorough search of the apartment, absolutely nobody was there. Our theory is one of two things. One, he's got some sort of demonic, negative, paranormal energy attached to him. His mental illness and inability to control himself leads us to believe that he was a weak target for attachment. The anger and straight-up deplorable things he's done to my family makes it easy for us to believe this. In addition, it's commonly believed that demonic presences are the only ones able to mimic one's voice and appearance. Maybe we're just reaching for a reason to push his horrible deeds onto something paranormal to not believe that a person is capable of such things. The second theory is that his extreme and uncontrolled energy has manifested itself into some sort of poltergeist activity, explaining all of the noises, movement, visions, and bad energy. We're not really sure what's going on, but it was terrifying. There's been a beach house in my family since 1950. We built it, and as far as I'm concerned, no one ever died in that house. However, I don't know what the property was before, and my family has a lot of secrets. I'm only 19, so I don't know many of them. Anyway, I was probably about 8 years old, and the house is small, so my mom, my dad, and I were all sleeping in a king-sized bed. When I briefly woke up and poked my head out from under the covers, the first thing I see when I look across the room is a green man in a black robe. I don't recall seeing any facial features or anything like that, and it was 11 years ago. But at 8 years old, I whispered without looking away, Mom! Turns out she was already awake, and without me saying another word, she says, I see it too. I asked her how to make it go away, and she told me to put my head under the covers again. Thanks for the help, Mom. By the time I woke up again, it was morning and the thing was gone. I spend most summers down the shore still, and I have never seen anything like this again. The interesting thing is that my mom said it was entirely black with no green face, but I remember it having a green face. Could be just a light from the window that I saw but I thought that was interesting. After some research, I've concluded that it was probably a shadow person, but either way, it was a crazy experience that both my mom and I witnessed. This happened back in 2009. I was a freshman in high school and had never experienced anything truly paranormal until that one night. 
I went up to hang out with my best friend at the time and his girlfriend. We all lived within walking distance of each other, just to give you an idea of how close we were. I was almost never home, because quite frankly, I didn't want to be there due to my abusive stepfather. Nothing paranormal about that, though. Our new favorite game that we all liked to play was hide-and-seek in the dark, or some people may refer to it as manhunt. I know different games are played differently and called different things depending on where you're from. We had played that there so many times during the day that we all knew the essential hiding locations, and it almost wasn't fun anymore. At night, we wouldn't use any flashlights or any sort of aid. It made it more challenging and fun. You could use the shadows and dark spots to your advantage. So long as you were concealed, you were pretty much set. My favorite spot to hide was along the one side of his house, where no light could pass through. I would lay down flat behind a few shrubs, and it was a good spot until they started to catch on. It was my time to seek, and everyone was finally hidden. Another fun part we added in was that you could change your hiding spot during any point of time, and if you were en route, the person who was it would have to tag you. Pretty common rules. This was my first time seeking at night, and I didn't realize how hard it was until then. I checked the dark part of the house first. I went to every spot I could think of, and I couldn't find anyone. I started to get anxious because it was taking longer than I thought it should have. I started to go toward the other side of the house and began to walk down towards their garage. I was trying to be quiet, hoping I could hear some sort of rustle or movement. Then I saw my opportunity. A human-shaped shadow began to move across my friend's house. I got extremely excited and shouted, Isaac, I've got you. And as I reached out to grab him, the shadow moved in front of his open garage door and nothing was there. I opened my fist and began to immediately shake with fear. I called out to my friends, both of which were nowhere near the area, and told them what happened. We were all spooked, to say the least. And then, we all stopped again, dead in our tracks. The boy figure was now sitting with his face in his hands on his neighbor's porch. We all saw it. He then got up and ran around the corner disappearing from our sight. We all agreed to end the game there and then. A very bad storm started to roll in. I said goodbye to my friend, and I went with his girlfriend to her house for a sleepover. She always told me her house was haunted, which I believe, mainly because of the nasty vibe I got when I walked into her house. To make it worse, she offered to play with her Ouija board, which I had never heard about before then. I asked her, does it really work? To which she responded, do you want to find out? So us, being stupid teenagers, decided to use it. This is how every bad horror movie starts with Ouija boards. Again, I was unaware of the risks until after the fact. The board was a glow-in-the-dark version, just one that her mom had gotten her from a local bookstore. We went out into her hallway upstairs which was very small to begin with. It was just wide enough for a single person to walk through. We sat next to each other with the board in between us. We turned the lights out and it was pitch dark, other than a little sliver of light that was coming from her sister's bedroom. We began asking questions, but the board wasn't moving. I was about to call it quits when I looked over at my friend and noticed something strange down the hall. Her parents' door was shut, and on the door they had a long mirror hanging up. In front of the mirror, I saw the same boy from hide-and-seek, except now he was rocking back and forth with his head between his legs. I immediately threw my hand up and turned the light switch on and ended the session. When I looked to the floor next to me, there were two very large boot prints embedded into the carpet. I never spent the night, and I never wanted to again after that. 
Throughout all of this, I kept hoping that maybe we were just seeing our own shadows, and that our eyes were playing tricks on us in the dark, but I hardly think so. All of us still remember that to this day, and that happened ten years ago. That was just the first spiritual encounter I had, followed by many more to come. Another creepy thing about her house that I thought I would mention. On the ceiling above the staircase, it looked like there were multiple hand streaks in the paint that led all the way up the stairs. Their parents had tried to paint over it many times, but they would continually reappear. They looked like the handprints could have belonged to that of a small child. This happened several years ago. I live in southwest Missouri, and there are a lot of rural areas, as well as some larger cities pretty close together. This happened on a two-lane highway going through some of the rural areas. This part of Missouri has a lot of hills, and the road I was driving on was no exception. It was between 8 and 9 p.m., and my wife and I were driving down this dark highway doing about 55 to 60 miles per hour. Most of the hills are pretty gentle, but most of them are also blind, as in you can't see the traffic on the opposite side. We crested one such hill in an area of mostly farmland, with the closest house being a quarter of a mile or so. And as we did, there were these long legs crossing the road a foot or two from the driver's side of my car. I honestly only saw the legs and a bit of waist, nothing above that. Given that I was going at a pretty good speed and it was dark, it was hard to see any more. But we both clearly saw this. It happened so fast, I didn't have time to swerve or honk the horn. If this had been a real person, I would have killed them. I heard nobody yelling at me to slow down, no noise at all, and there was nothing in the rearview mirror. The odd thing is, there would be no reason for anybody to be walking on a blind hill out in this area, as there are no houses close by, and no mailboxes in this immediate area. My wife was spooked and said, what the hell was that? I said that it looked like disembodied legs, and we both agreed. We went back in the daytime and still could see no reason for somebody to be there, and no signs of anything unusual. Both sides of this road are bordered by barbed wire fence and weedy, steep ditches, so it's not easy to walk along. The other thing that makes me think it wasn't of this world is if it had been a living human, they would have heard my car coming half a mile away, as this is a very quiet area, and sound travels well out in the country. No sane person would stand on a blind hill knowing a car is approaching doing at least 55. To this day, I still wonder what the hell we saw. Years ago, when I was around 10 at the time, I was sleeping in bed when my brother Sam shouted for me. When I sleepily made my way out to the other room where he was using the computer, he asked me why I kept creeping in and out of the room behind him and ignoring him when he asked me what I was doing. The computer is by a window, so you can clearly see the reflection of the room at night. Sam said that he could see me in the reflection messing around behind him. I insisted that I hadn't been up for a few hours and that he was just trying to scare me but Sam insisted that he saw me. A couple of months apart from this story, another thing happened. Sam and I shared a room while my own bedroom was being redecorated. I was on the high bunk and Slam... <laughs> I was on the high bunk and Sam slept below. I was a pretty light sleeper. I saw the bedroom door open and I saw him leaving. I asked if he could bring me a glass of water, as I had a dry throat. He paused, said nothing, and continued to leave. He never came back in. 
When morning came, I was going to ask him about it, but he wasn't on his bed. I couldn't find him in the house either. So I asked my parents where he'd gone, and it turned out that entire night he was having a sleepover at a friend's house. He wasn't even home. It dawned on me then that I had remembered he left around dinner time the day before. I told my parents that somebody opened my bedroom door and stood there, but they just said I was seeing things. At the time I saw the figure, I was very tired, and it was really late at night. I'd clearly forgotten that Sam wasn't home, so I thought nothing of it at the time. But given the fact that it seems we both saw each other's doppelgangers, it creeps me out to this day. I've lived with ghosts my entire life. Well, at least I've lived with the idea that I was never really alone. Growing up, I always heard stories about my mom's experiences, seeing things in mirrors behind her and being visited by a loved one the night before I was born. Of course, I always took those kinds of stories with a grain of salt, until I started having my own experience. I grew up in a small co-op apartment in the suburbs of Queens, New York, and when I say suburbs, I mean 15 minutes away from the nearest subway station. We lived on the second floor, so we had access to an attic which was full of relics from the 40s and 50s. Over the years, the attic quickly filled up with all of our stuff to the point where it was next to impossible to walk up there. My first experience came in the form of unexplained noises. The sound of small feet, presumably children, running across the attic floor would keep me up at night, as the attic door was located right outside my bedroom door. Oftentimes, the sound of a rubber ball bouncing would accompany the running. After a while, I got used to the noises and quickly resorted to shouting, shut it, and the noises would stop. The next occurrence was on a sunny summer afternoon. My mom had just told me to take the trash out, and I gave her an okay while I finished playing up a video game. I hear the door lock, or unlock, I'm not sure which and I assumed it was my mom. My game finishes and I go to ask my mom if she took the trash out and that I would have done it. She tells me that she thought I did it because she also heard the door locks move. Needless to say, we were shook. The running has now turned to boots stomping in the attic and shut it isn't cutting it this time. Moving forward to my first time in the house alone for an entire week, as my mom was out of town. As a kid, I was scared shitless of the dark, as most of us are. Naturally, I kept all the lights on before bed. One night, as I was eating my dinner, I heard the floor creak from the living room. I didn't think much of it, as an old house is bound to make these noises from time to time. That's when I heard the voice of a woman as clear as day humming a song. This scared the ever-living crap out of me, and you can bet I slept with the lights on. This would also be the first time that I heard a voice, but it wouldn't be the last. Fast forward to a few months back. I'm home from college for one of the few breaks I get. We're now in a townhouse in upstate New York. We also adopted a puppy we named Louie. It was my understanding that the ghostly occurrences had stopped when we moved out of the old co-op. My mind changed during that school break. Unfortunately, about a month prior, my father had passed away and was cremated. I keep his ashes with me wherever I go. They currently sit next to my bedside. My mom had told me that she had seen the silhouette of a man in my doorway when I wasn't home. I assumed it was my dad and thought nothing more of it, until the night that we changed the smoke detector batteries. As you may know, a smoke detector beeps quite loudly when the batteries are low, so I got up on a ladder and took it down to change them. I did so and put it back up, pressing the test button to make sure everything was good to go. 
Upon doing so, my mom claimed to hear a woman's voice, which I did not hear for myself. Seconds later, a huge bang came from downstairs, in the kitchen, to be exact. Poor Louie was barking at whatever had caused the sound. My mom and I cautiously made our way down, to find that the house phone we had positioned on the far wall on a windowsill had flown across the room, still plugged into the wall. We didn't know what to make of it, as it didn't make sense for there to be some sort of power surge that would cause it to literally travel three feet across the room. No other electronics were affected, just that one. This was by far the most violent, unexplained experience we have ever had. Last night, things got weirder. I'm home for summer break, and it's been months since the phone incident. Louis, who is now much older and isn't as jumpy as he was when he was a pup, randomly started growling and barking into the darkness past my mom's bedroom door. I was in the basement, watching a horror movie, which made the situation worse, to say the least. I ran up upon receiving a text from my mom to grab Louie. When I got up there, the fear on this poor dog's face was unsettling. And when I picked him up and moved him around, he had his eyes locked onto something that was still located right outside my mom's door. This has never happened with him before, and I'm still not sure what to think of it. The presence that has been following us around for years is seemingly getting more and more aggressive. My mom carries around these evil eye things. I'm not sure what exactly they're called, but they're blue and white colored bead things that are painted to look like eyes. She has them all over the house, and a lot of the times they break with no explanation, even when they're brand new. Whether or not you believe any of this is up to you, but... We're not really sure what's going on, or why it followed us. A few years ago, when I was 16 to 17, I worked in a restaurant as a waitress. There were two locations, one in my town, which I'll call Restaurant A, and one in a town about 30 minutes away, Restaurant B. I should mention that Restaurant B is located in a rougher area, and many of my co-workers weren't from the best of backgrounds. Nonetheless, they were sweet people, and I trusted them. I was trusted as a manager on Thursdays at Restaurant B, which usually meant that I was the cashier, server, and manager. The only other person would be a cook, who I'll call Dave. In the restaurant, there is a front glass door that customers use and a back wood door. No window in that one. We use that one to take the trash out and things like that. One day, we had no business, and I was in the kitchen with Dave and another cook, who was about to leave. We're standing around talking, with Dave right in front of the back door, the other cook to the side of the door, and me about five feet away from Dave in line with the door. He had a bag of trash in his hand, and he was going to take it out. He opened the door while still facing me and talking. Behind the door was a person. It was clearly a person in a gray t-shirt, jeans, and a black hat. I saw him for a split second, long enough to know that someone was there, and then Dave saw my face and turned around. This blocked my view, and the guy was gone. The other cook saw my face turn white as a sheet when Dave had opened the door and joked that I looked like I had seen a ghost. Oh, the irony. Dave started looking around outside to see what I could have seen. I started actually panicking. I do have severe anxiety and a panic disorder, and Dave was trying to calm me down, but he also seemed really freaked out. He asked me what I saw, and I told him that I had seen someone. I described the person, and what he told me next will never leave me. Dave starts crying and ran out the door with his phone in his hand. He was outside for nearly half an hour, and when he came back in, he was calmer, but still nervous. 
He told me that roughly ten years ago, he and his friend were in a horrible car accident, which ended with his friend's death. He told me that the person I described standing outside of the door was wearing the exact outfit his friend had died in. Apparently, I wasn't the first person to see the ghost of his friend. Dave told me that whenever something were to happen to anyone in his family, his friend would show up to either him or his family. For example, one time he saw the ghost of his friend, and literally a minute later his phone rang, and he found out that his father had just suffered a massive heart attack. When he had gone out of the door, he was calling his family to make sure everybody was okay. Luckily they were, but not even two days later, he found out that his wife had miscarried. As if that wasn't weird enough, the same night that I saw the ghost, something else weird happened that I believe was paranormal, but that I understand could also have been paranoia. I was up at the front, at the register, still shaken up, and a huge crow was hovering outside the front door. It was so weird. It literally was just flying in place. It suddenly flew away, and then a really strange-looking man approached the door and opened it wide, but didn't enter. He had the creepiest smile on his face the entire time. Moments later, the crow was back, and it almost came into the restaurant, but another customer swatted it away. The man literally turned around and left, didn't order anything, and never spoke a word. I personally don't believe in ghosts. Nonetheless, I am very interested in paranormal stuff, mostly because I enjoy a good horror story. Everyone experiences something creepy now and then, and even though I am a large skeptic, I too have found myself in some situations that creeped me out a bit. In the end, I always found a satisfying explanation for what I encountered. And then I probably just forget that it ever happened. Or I remember it and just find it funny because of how silly I was for being so scared. Most people experience their creepy stories at night, which is no big surprise because it's just natural to be more aware at that time. We tend to feel more vulnerable in the darkness. Our eyesight is no more reliable, which leads to the fact that sudden sounds or noises can't be easily explained. This leads me to some very strange encounters that I experienced in the middle of the day on a crowded street. It was May. The weather was very pleasant and warm. The local city marathon took place that day in which some of my mother's co-workers took part, so she took me with her to cheer them on. While the running track led around the inner districts of our city, we took shortcuts to get to the checkpoints in time. After a while, we crossed a bridge, which ended at an intersection. You could say there was quite a lot of traffic that day, and many other pedestrians and spectators of the marathon were crowding the street. As we waited for the pedestrian lights to turn green, I looked at the ground, and my mother was holding my hand. I was around 11 years old. The sidewalk was very crowded, so there was hardly any space for everyone. I looked at my shoes, and then on the shoes of the other pedestrians. All of them were pointing to the street that they were just about to cross in a minute. When I looked up again, a young woman was standing right in front of me, looking at me and moving her lips, whispering strangely with tears in her eyes. She was standing so close that I would have touched her if I had just reached out my index finger toward her. I looked around, but nobody showed any kind of reaction, not even my mother, who was always very cautious and sometimes even snapped at me when I just looked at weird people on the street. It felt like no one else but me saw this strange woman. I'll never forget what she looked like. She was very skinny. Her skin was pale, dry, and kind of dirty, just like her clothes. She wore a beige, worn-out cardigan, a long skirt, 
and damaged leather shoes. Her hair was light brown and short, chin length, and like the rest of her skin, her lips were very dry. Yellowish chunks of skin stood off of them as they moved while she was whispering straight into my face. I couldn't hear what she was saying. She was probably only moving her lips, but I really can't tell what exactly was going on there. I couldn't look away, and I was so in shock that I couldn't even say anything. When the pedestrian lights finally turned green, everyone moved forward. The woman stepped aside, and I guess she just stayed there on the sidewalk. I didn't see her crossing the street with us, and when I turned around on the other side, she was gone. How did she even get there? In the middle of the bridge was a lane of traffic. You couldn't access the bridge from any other side because on both the left and the right was quite a large river bank with bushes. It puzzles me to this day. This woman looked as if she'd been falling into muddy water and had let her clothes just dry onto her body. A few years later, I tried to find out if this bridge with the river underneath it was a common spot to jump off, or if something tragic had happened there. But in my country, it's nearly impossible to get public access to that kind of information. As a skeptic, I don't believe she was a ghost. It's more likely for her to be a deranged person roaming the streets. But I don't understand why everybody acted as if nobody was there. Even my mother looked over to me during the incident and didn't seem to mind at all. I wish I knew who this woman was and if she needed help. And if she did, why would she talk to a little kid instead of an adult? My boyfriend of five years has crushed on me for probably 12 or 13. He was two grade levels below me and was a bad boy while I was popular and in all honors college level classes, so I wasn't aware he existed until I met him at my dad's business about seven years ago. He apparently talked about me being his dream girl and was teased that it would never happen. So in 2009, he and his best friend, I'll call him Josh, were getting into pills due to Josh's grandfather being an amputee and unable to properly attend or understand hiding the medications, thus leaving large amounts of methadone and other drugs lying around. This was before the opioid crisis that has affected my generation deeply in the last 15 years. Two days before Christmas 2009, Josh overdosed in the bedroom that my boyfriend is currently staying in. It's a long story, but we moved back to our respective families because we were laid off during the pandemic and were in a bad wreck, losing our extra car. The room has never felt spooky, never anything strange about it, but I've had a few pranks pulled on me that we believe Josh does to basically congratulate my boyfriend on being with the woman he waited for. I have woken up to sticky notes completely covering my body, my drinks poured on the floor, and random objects moved right where I exit the bed so that I step on them first thing in the morning. I swear I've heard giggling. Each time I have angrily asked my boyfriend if he was messing with me, and I know when he's lying. He always says no, and I believe him. We like to think that this is Josh playing practical jokes, something he was known for but this is nothing compared to what Josh did for me in 2017. It wasn't a prank, it saved my life. Four years ago, I went into anaphylactic shock. I lost all ability to speak or move my lower body. I was upstairs with a curved and steep staircase separating me from my phone. I remember crawling to the stairs, knowing it could be fatal if I smashed into the wall that the stairs led to before the turn with very large, steep steps. I know I was extremely oxygen deprived, but I immediately saw Josh and two of my deceased best friends ascend the stairs and carry me to the living room couch with my nebulizer and cell phone. I called 911, but I had no voice. My friends were gone, except Josh. 
He told me he was going to go wake up my boyfriend from the hammock in the back of my yard. All of a sudden, my boyfriend dreamed of this friend saying that I was in trouble. My boyfriend came running into the house, and by this point, I was literally dying. I could no longer use any part of my body, and no air came into my lungs when I inhaled. I remember thinking of my daughter and praying her father would navigate my loss to her and keep memories of me alive. He actually died in a freak accident eight months ago, so now I'm fulfilling that for him, but I digress. I struggled to remain conscious, but I was fading. My boyfriend saw the 911 operator on the phone and my sweaty blue body. He told them he didn't think I was breathing, and by some absolute miracle, there was an ambulance passing my neighborhood. The hospital and dispatch were 30 minutes away. This coincidence, plus my boyfriend's sudden premonition that I was hurt, saved my life. Josh and those EMTs saved my life. I remember the EMT asking my boyfriend if I had overdosed. I hadn't. And I thought of how Josh had died. I was blabbering on about dead people saving me after a large amount of epinephrine, so no wonder they thought I was high. The doctors and EMT were baffled at how I managed to get down those stairs, or even stay alive long enough to get help. I had one bruise on my leg, and it was really tiny. That was it. Well, and the worst headache I've ever had. Turns out I'm allergic to the latex and spray paint. I just told them that I slid down the stairs, but that's not how I remember it. The weird thing is, I had never met Josh when he was alive. I don't know how I recognized him or hallucinated him, but he looked exactly like the picture I was shown after the fact. I've had a lot of paranormal encounters, but my run-in with Josh saved my life, and he never even knew me. So thanks, Josh, for giving me more time on this earth, and I wish we had met many years before. I do hope that he's resting peacefully, but just periodically decides to pop in and check on us. So I've had a couple of ghost encounters that really messed me up, but this one in particular was the worst. So my mom was dating a guy who I wouldn't call redneck, but definitely not like a normal country guy. He also had a son who I still stay in close contact with to this day. Basically, almost every Sunday, we would go out to my stepdad's mom's house. She lived in the middle of the woods, but not secluded like there were no other houses in the area. But directly across the dirt road, there was an abandoned house that pretty much looked like what you would expect an abandoned house to look like. So my stepbrother and I would go in there every once in a while for fun and would see some weird stuff, like a random chair in the middle of a room and a cooler full of dead roses. But one day we were headed in there like usual, but once I took a step in, I just wanted to throw up. My brother kept going and was telling me that it would be fine and to just come in, but I was not going in there. A couple of minutes of talking go by, and all of a sudden, my brother's face turns pale, and he drops his water bottle and runs out without saying a word. I follow him, asking him to slow down, and he says that we're never going in there again. When I asked why, he said that he heard a voice whisper in his ear and tell him to run. We never told our parents until like two years later. At the time, we were 12. but. He was true to his word. We never went back. My twin and I had adjoining bedrooms, and she had to enter my room to exit the house. We shared in experiences. If she got hurt, I would have sympathy pains, etc. She would always come over to my bed in the night complaining that she heard something or had a bad dream. One night, she called out to me, Sissy, can you come to my bed? I refused and told her to come to me. She replied that she couldn't and absolutely begged me. I could hear in her voice that something was very wrong. 
I got up and walked to the light switch to turn on the light, and I looked through her door. I saw a tall, dark hooded figure at the bottom of her bed. It turned around and looked at me. There was no face, only a void. I immediately flipped the lights on, and it was gone. Before I could say anything, my sister asked me, Did you see it? Chills ran down my spine. She said, Did you see it? Did you see the tall, dark thing at the bottom of my bed? It's been watching me all night. I'm not a believer in ghosts, but I cannot explain what we saw together that night so many years ago. She's convinced that it was something evil. To this day, I don't know. Okay, so this experience was actually my mom's. When I was nine, about 24 years ago, my mom's older sister passed away very unexpectedly. She was only 35. It was also just a very tragic situation. Anyway, my grandparents, mom, and other aunt were devastated, and I remember it just being a very sad time. So fast forward to about a month to six weeks after her passing, we just moved into a new house, and all of this was going on while we were waiting on the autopsy report, cause of death, things like that. So one night, my mom woke up from a dead sleep and felt compelled to go down to the kitchen. As she turned the light on, to her absolute shock, there sat my Aunt Veronica on the bar stool at the kitchen counter. Mom said that she looked just like she did in real life, not ghostly or transparent or whatever. She told my mom that she knew everybody was worried, and she apologized for how she left, but she said that she had to go. She told my mom she was at peace and that her passing was all for the best. Mom said she looked so peaceful and happy. She told my mom that she was going to wake up and not believe that this happened, so she was going to give her proof. She said we would be receiving a check for a large amount that we weren't expecting, and when she got that check, mom would know what had happened was real and not a dream. Well, lo and behold, the next day, thinking it was all a dream, my mom ventured out to the mailbox. Inside was a tax credit check for a large amount. In that moment, she burst into tears. She unequivocally knew that what had happened the night before was real. This isn't the only time she's visited us since she passed. She comes to me in dreams every now and then. I actually keep her Bible on my nightstand, and every time I dream of her, I write it down on a piece of notebook paper folded up inside. I know that she really is visiting me, and that it's not just a dream. Like I said, the circumstances around her death were very tragic. I will mention that our entire family was under the impression that she had died of a heart attack. She did have a pre-existing heart condition. But it wasn't until my granddad passed away in 2020 that we saw the actual autopsy report. My aunt had actually committed suicide by taking 30 prescription pills at one time. This is something my grandparents carried with them all those years and never revealed to my mom, her sister, or anyone else. I think the actual cause of her death is the reason why she visits so often. I assume there's a lot of guilt she has about how she chose to go. Either way, my aunt was the most wonderful person. She never had kids or a husband. We honestly talk about and think about her every day. Even all these years later, this is one of just many memorable encounters with her following her death. And since my grandmother and grandfather have passed, they now accompany her in our dreams. Back in 2000, when I was 20, a friend of mine, a 19-year-old female, decided that she wanted to get an apartment and asked if I would be her roommate. I didn't really need a place to stay, but we decided to do it anyway. 
We moved to a nice apartment complex right next to and behind the house where my aunt saw her dead ex-boyfriend. The place was nice and newer, so the thought of it being haunted never crossed my mind. I didn't even experience anything until my roommate got homesick a month in and had to move back in with her folks, leaving me there alone for three months. It started with the lights coming on by themselves. I would go to bed, always turning the lights off and always closing my bedroom door. I was meticulous about the lights because that's how I was raised. I'd go to bed and at some point open my eyes and see light coming in under the door. I thought my roommate had come home. So I would get out of bed excited to see her, only to discover I was still alone and the dining room or bathroom light would be on. Then the knocking started. Right after I'd lay down, there would be three loud knocks on my bedroom door. Again, thinking my roommate had come home, I would get up to greet her only to find that I was still very much alone. A week or so before Christmas, my roommate and I went out gift shopping and went back to the apartment to wrap everything up. When we were done, we were both standing at the door, checking to see if we had everything before leaving. The apartment was completely quiet, and we heard this clearly. My acoustic guitar, which I had leaning up against the wall in my bedroom with the pick stuck between three strings, was plucked each string in succession, then slid along the wall until hitting the floor. We just looked at each other, then walked to my bedroom to find the guitar on the floor with the pick still stuck between the strings. Those strings had been plucked, meaning the pick had been used and then replaced when done. At Christmas, during a party with her and some other friends at the apartment, the VCR turned itself off. It did that one or two other times while living there, never before or after. For Christmas, my girlfriend got me a guitar tablature book for Pink Floyd's The Wall. One night, I sat on the floor of my bedroom, learning how to play a song in it. When I was done, I put the pick in the strings and set my guitar up on the wall. But instead of closing the book as I normally did, I left it open and went to bed. Just after laying down, I heard the pages in the book flipping on their own. It was a thick book, but the song I had been learning was somewhere in the middle. I figured that the weight of the pages made it change pages on its own. But when they stopped flipping, I got curious, and I got up to look. The pages stopped flipping on the song, Hey You. And when I read the title, I got chills and shut the book, pleaded with the ghost to let me sleep, and went back to bed. While laying there, I realized if the pages had flipped on their own from the weight, they would have gone the other way, away from that song. After that, I started calling the ghost Pink. Anytime something happened, I would just say, oh, hey, Pink. But one night I had been out with a friend until around 2 a.m. And when I opened my door and stepped in, I could feel the ghost standing there. I said, Oh, hi, Pink. And I could feel the energy go through me and out of the apartment. So that's when I figured it didn't like being called that, which didn't stop me from saying it. Shortly after, my roommate came back and stayed the rest of the lease. Not much happened then. I figured if an entire house could be haunted, then surely an entire apartment building could be. I wanted to ask my neighbors if they ever experienced anything, but never did and actually never really talked to them at all. My roommate and I were and are really good friends. We never dated, we never slept together. She was also really good friends with my girlfriend and it was my girlfriend who told her to ask me to move in with her. Also, I've known since I was around 10 or so that I could feel ghosts, if you will, but usually only when standing right where they were. If I stood with them long enough, I could usually get an image in my head of what they looked like, as well as their mood. In a few instances, I've had them communicate with me like that, their words coming to me as thoughts or images, usually the latter. I usually don't tell people this because they typically don't believe me, and I would just rather not go through with the ridicule and name calling. However, with Pink, I never figured out who or what it was. I always felt that it was male, but I didn't know. 
I still wonder about it from time to time. So, in 2019, my family are all driving back from Narrabeen when we drove in Wakehurst Parkway. There is a legend of this road where a lady all in white is on the side of the road, and if you're not careful, she can appear in your car. So, like I said, we're driving back and it's about 9 p.m. We were in the thick brush area. My mother, brother, sister, and I were asleep. My father was the only one awake and was all alone, as he puts it. He said that he was driving when he saw this lady, all in white, standing on the side of the road. He freaked out, but continued to drive. However, he said he saw the same lady two minutes later, on the same side of the road. My father told us he was so freaked out that he tried to drive faster. Two minutes later, the same lady again. After we got home, he told us what had happened. Personally, I couldn't sleep for a night or so. This is by far the scariest thing that I've experienced. Where my boyfriend used to live, at his mom's, he's moved out now. It was like a new build complex. Lots of new houses and roads, like its own little village. Built around a mental asylum. They knocked the majority of it down, but what remained was the administrative building, church, and a large garden. We'd walk the dogs in the garden at night, and I always got feelings in there. Kind of in my shoulders like something was behind me, or watching me. It never felt malicious, but it creeped me out all the same. Being the adventurous people we are, we decided to explore the administrative building, so we gathered a few friends and headed off. This was during the day, as it was guarded at night. Getting inside involved lots of climbing through windows and up scaffolding. Once in, we split off and explored but it was in such a state of ruin we didn't get too far. I found some stairs down to another floor and stood there for a while. I heard footsteps up the stairs and did a runner. I told the guys and they were on the other side of the building, so it definitely wasn't them. We kept hearing doors slamming, but it was a calm and sunny day. Thoroughly creeped out, we left and just explored the grounds and some of the other smaller buildings. When we got home, I was absolutely exhausted, like really drained, but I didn't think much of it. The next night I was back at home and settling down to sleep, but I couldn't get comfortable. I could feel something watching me from the end of my bed. I tossed and turned, trying to ignore it, but I could feel it, staring. I got really upset and started crying, it was so intense. I then got a thought that passed through my mind. You came to stare at me, so I'm staring at you. I bolted into my parents' room next door and told them. They calmed me down, and when I went back to bed, it was gone. Another time, we were in the garden late at night with a friend, and as usual, I could feel something there. My boyfriend and his friend were facing toward me, and I was facing them. At the other end of the garden, I saw what looked like arms and the tops of legs, walking behind a sort of archway in the garden. It was almost see-through white, and walked for about five seconds before I told the guys. Of course, it wasn't there when they turned around. The garden has got high walls all around it, so it definitely wasn't a car, and there was no one else there. That place is definitely haunted. I did some research, and the residents at the unit used to visit the garden and spend a lot of time there. They weren't treated well, and they still used all the old-fashioned treatments for mental health and learning disabilities. We haven't been back since, as my boyfriend doesn't live with his mom anymore, like I mentioned. I have always experienced the paranormal, and I'm definitely open to sensing spirits. 
Honestly, being followed though was the scariest thing I've ever been through. When I was three, my grandmother on my mom's side died of a heart attack. While at the funeral, the adults were outside talking and smoking cigarettes. My older brother, another family member that was close to our ages, and I were told to stay inside. They said that it was to keep us out of conversations we didn't need to hear, but who knows. Well, the other family member convinced my brother that locking me in the viewing room was a good idea. It's those rooms with red lights over the coffin. Once they locked me in, the other family member called through the door. He said the grandma needed to take me with her because I was her favorite. I screamed and cried as loud as my little self could, and some adults took me outside to my parents. I was told that they were just playing and that even though grandma loved me, she was never going to take me away. Later that year, we moved two states away. One night in the new house about four years after, I woke up in the middle of the night, which according to my mother was highly unusual. I heard a song that only my grandma ever sang to me. I sat up and looking around, and I see the lid on my old toy box opening by itself. Slowly it creaked open. Once it was fully open, I saw what looked like my grandma slowly standing from inside the box. She turned slowly and really creepily to look at me. I was frozen in place. I couldn't cry or scream or even move. She started walking toward me. She stepped close to the bed and said, I came to get you. You were always my favorite and I want you with me now. Somehow I found my voice and screamed. My mom came running in and just before she got to my room, this grandma said, I'll come back for you again, and vanished. My mother came in asking who I was talking to. I told her everything, and mom let me sleep in the living room for a few nights while she got rid of my toy box. The toy box was the last thing that my grandma had ever given me. My mom told me that grandma would never scare me, and that it was the boogeyman. Later in life, I tried to ask her what she thought it was, but she told me it was over and done with and to stop talking about it. To this day, she won't talk about it or answer any of my questions. In the town of Baldenboro, just eight miles southwest of Elizabethtown, where I stay, it was said that a demon cat from hell used to stalk the woods, killing livestock and making the locals scared. And then, suddenly, it disappeared. That's what they say anyway. But we know that it didn't. To this day, there have been reports of something that looks like an abnormally large mountain lion with blood-red eyes and fur as black as night. Its cries have been compared to that of a woman being torn apart and screaming for her life. Luckily, it's only ever gotten a taste for goats and cows, or so we think anyway. I will tell you, there have been a few people that have gone missing. Some have been found, and to hear some of the police tell the stories, the bodies were torn to shreds. It's not just located in Baldenboro, like most think. It goes from Bladen Lake State Forest to the Green Swamp, which covers three counties and over 1,200 square miles. A friend of mine was hunting one day down in the Green's Swamp when it started getting dark. If you hunt in this area, you know that you've got to be out of the woods by dark, by law. So he climbed down from his tree stand and began the long walk through the swamp and underbrush to where he had parked his truck. Now, my friend is a cornbread fed Southern boy and has the size to prove it. Standing at six foot six with a weight of 260 pounds, he is pure farm muscle and he's not small by any standard. So he's learned not to be afraid of anything. He said that what happened next 
made him never want to go hunting in that swamp again. Making his way through the brush, he said he began hearing something walking through the woods toward him. He stopped to listen for it and said that it sounded like a large black bear, so he got his gun ready just in case. When he stopped, it stopped. When he walked, it walked. He said it made him nervous because whatever it was knew he was there and wasn't running off. He said that he started making noise and even shot his gun into the air as a warning. It didn't leave. Instead, it let out a growl, he said, that you could feel as much as hear. All the way through the woods, it just stayed behind him and out of sight, but he knew that he was being stalked. When he came out of the woods onto the dirt road, he said his truck was about 50 yards down from him. He decided that there was a pretty good chance that whatever was following him was going to keep following or make a move on him there. So he took off running. It took off running too. He said that it sounded like a bulldozer was crashing through the woods. And when it broke from the woods, it sounded like a horse running through loose dirt. He could hear the stomps of its feet and the growling of its breath. He didn't have to look back to know that it was coming and catching up to him. He shot behind him hoping that it would scare it enough to stop for a moment and give him a chance to make it to the truck. When he did, he said he must have hit it because it screamed. For a moment, he thought it was a person. That's when he finally turned around. He said this thing was jet black, as big as a 600 pound black bear, a tail as long as its body and eyes that were glowing red. He hit it and it was just standing there, looking at him, as if to say, now you've done it. He bolted to the truck and jumped in. Just as he shut the door, he looked and it was right there. He said the thing was so close that its breath was fogging the window. By now he said he was shaking so badly and it was everything he could do to get the key in the ignition and start the motor. He drives a Ford F-350 four-wheel drive that was raised up, so there's a good two feet of clearance under the truck. He said this thing was on all four feet and looking eye to eye with him in his truck. The engine started and he took off like a bat out of hell. He said it chased him as hard as it could until he picked up speed and stopped and watched him drive off after that. The next day, he and his dad went back with guns and looked around for tracks, blood, or even a dead body. He said there was no blood, even though he knows it was shot, and there were paw prints as big as his hands on the ground everywhere. Then they found a tree that nine feet up had claw marks one inch deep in the wood, spaced about four inches apart from each other. They didn't venture into the woods, nor did they go too far from the truck. Both of them said they felt as though they were being watched and didn't want to stick around to find out what it was. They got back into the truck, and that's when they heard it, a scream from the woods off in the distance. He said it was that same scream, like a woman screaming bloody murder. It was there, letting them know that it was there and that it was waiting. There are many a dark secrets in them woods, as my grandpa would say, Charlie Daniels even wrote about these woods in one of his songs. If you ever get adventurous and want to try your luck, come on down to Green's Swamp, and when the sun goes down, get real quiet. You might hear that scream. I hope when you do, it's off in the distance and not close by. Because if it is, well, it might just be the last sound you hear. I have absolutely no memory of this experience. I was a little over two years old and just starting to walk on my own when this event took place. My mom only told me this story about three years ago when I was 32 and about to get married. My mother was raised in a very tiny fundamentalist Christian community and had no belief in the paranormal. She believed that our souls sleep until judgment day or something like that. Ergo, there are no ghosts or spirits around to haunt houses. 
Even over 30 years later, she still sounded terrified as she told me this. This woman who always talks way too loud was literally whispering by the end of it and was white as a sheet. I believed her completely and I still do. My mom never talks about stuff like this. I'm just glad that I can't remember it also. In 1988, my parents had their second child. This was my brother, whom I'll call Victor. We were very crowded in our rented flat with two babies. My parents decided to move to a rambling old two-story farmhouse on a seven-acre plot in southern Ohio for more room for the family. It was way out in the sticks and took almost an hour to get to town from there. My mom said that the very first time I saw the house, I freaked out. I was crying and saying things like, don't like mean house, mean the house, ugly house, don't like, scary house, mama, don't like. My mom said this behavior was very out of character for me, but I stopped complaining about the house after a few weeks, so she just chalked it up to the stress of the move. Now, this house was ramshackle and in the middle of nowhere. The kitchen was to the far rear of the house, and until recently before we moved in, still had a working ancient wood-burning cooking stove against the back wall. This had caught the back wall on fire a couple of months before we moved in, and had caused a lot of damage. A lot of that damage wasn't fixed. So my young, broke parents got a very cheap rental agreement gotta love the 80s. On the second floor, directly above the kitchen, was a locked room. The landlord claimed that it had heavy fire damage, but her son, who had done the repairs, claimed the only fire damage left was in the kitchen, since it had been the worst and was beyond his skill level to fix. Either way, the landlord was absolutely adamant that the room was off limits, and my parents always respected that. I would have looked, 100%. I know all this because I heard stories about the crappy farmhouse with the creepy door my whole life, and there were pictures of us in and around the farmhouse. The locked door was right next to the upstairs landing, so there was no avoiding it. Both my parents have told me that it gave them the creeps. A few months after we moved in, my mother and I were in the yard with our pit Doberman mix, Boss. She was hanging laundry and I was rolling around with Boss. She said that just as she noticed that everything was way too silent, Boss started going ape from surprisingly far away. About 500 yards from the house on the left, there was a small duck pond. Boss was in between the two, running toward my mom, then turning and running back toward the pond, then back to my mom, barking frantically the whole time. My mom saw something thrashing around in the middle of the pond. She took off toward the water at full speed. Boss beat her there and dragged me out of the water himself. Thanks, pupper. Although my mom was confused how I got so far so fast and how I had gotten into the center of the pond since it was over my head and I couldn't swim, she figured she underestimated me and brought in the baby gates and the play pens. I was to be contained from now on. A few weeks later, she was cooking downstairs. Boss was outside, Victor was asleep in his crib, and I was in my playpen in my room upstairs. I also had a gate on my door and one at the top of the stairs. The stairs ran up from the side of the kitchen, so my mom said she could listen for us crying or fussing while she cooked. My mom said no longer than 15 minutes after the last time she looked in on us kids, Boss started going crazy again, in the yard. She runs up to check on us, Victor is still sleeping. Every baby gate is still shut and locked, but I am not in my room. A frenzied search reveals that I'm not in the house at all. A sudden image of Boss saving me from drowning causes my mom to rush outside to see what he's trying to tell her this time. She said he was running circles in the yard, barking uncontrollably. When she got outside, he took off toward the right, away from the pond. He would run ahead, turn around and bark at my mother, wait for her to catch up a little and then race off again. He ended up leading her almost a mile and a half out onto the dirt road that separated our property from our neighbors. And then he led her to a thick stand of trees on our neighbor's side of the rocky drive. She said what hit her first was the foul stench of advanced decay. 
She plowed into the trees with her heart in her throat and her stomach full of ice. She said she noticed many piles of corrugated tin, tarps, tires, and other debris. The miasma was emanating most strongly from these junkyard cairns. Peeking under a sheet of tin, she discovered the extremely decomposed corpse of a butchered cow. As she headed deeper into the thicket, where the tree cover was denser, she said less care was taken to cover the remains. Grizzly pieces of bones and rotted chunks of bovine littered the area. Apparently, our neighbor, in an effort to cheat his taxes, had been illegally slaughtering cattle and hiding the remains in at least one of the few thick stands of trees around. She found me in the dead center of this thicket, just standing there, looking around like I was confused, surrounded by carnage. She said I didn't seem scared or anything, I was just standing. She rushed over to me and, after ascertaining that I wasn't injured, began to question me on why I was there and how I'd gotten there. Keep in mind that although my mother said I started speaking very young, I still didn't have much of a vocabulary. She said that I told her, with that serious look only small children can give, that the children had brought me here. Shatting her pants at the thought that anyone, even children, could walk right past her through the kitchen, get me from upstairs and walk right past her on the way down the stairs and out with me, she demanded to know what children and where the hell they are now. I looked her dead serious in the eye and told her, the ones that live with us in the room at the top of the stairs. I don't see them anymore. After a moment of stunned silence, she started asking all kinds of questions about these children. However, she told me that I refused to say anything else. She said as long as she questioned me about what happened, I would just stand there staring at her with that serious expression and my mouth closed. She said the same pattern held true every other time she brought it up to me. So she was always left wondering and immediately began hounding my dad about moving closer to town. While the incident with me getting to the pond was highly unlikely, it was at least remotely possible. My mother is adamant that me being in the hidden slaughter yard that day was a flat impossibility. She says there's no way that I could have even known it was out there, much less have had the ability to open and relock the baby gates, get downstairs past her and two miles down the road, all in under 15 minutes. I was only two and as slow and clumsy as most toddlers are. As I said, it's 30 years later and she's still shaken by it. I have no idea what happened that day. I have thought about hypnosis, but haven't yet decided that I really want to remember. Maybe it's better to let it be a mystery, because whatever those things were, I highly doubt that they were children. In 2013, my wife and I divorced and we both moved into separate homes. The divorce went well and we are still good friends to this day, partly because we have a daughter together. We agreed to split custody over our daughter and I rented an old house in a historic district in the city where we live. It was a very pretty home, built in 1935 but kept up very well. I would have my daughter two weeks at a time and she had a bedroom in the back of the house. She was three years old at the time, and I kept noticing her talking to her friend. One day I found her in a little closet, talking to someone, and I remember her saying that she was talking to another little girl named Betty. I have no idea where she heard the name Betty, as she was only three years old, but I just chalked it all up to a child's vivid imagination. Keep in mind, I'm a single dad to a little girl. I really have no idea what I'm doing, when it comes to dressing, hair, or little girl stuff in general. Her mother is good at that stuff, but not me. I put my daughter to bed one night after her bath. I remember brushing her hair that night, but that was all I did. The very next morning, her mom came to pick her up from my house, and my daughter was just waking up. Her mom went back to her bedroom to find my daughter's hair was fixed into two perfect French braids. Her mom was really proud of me at first, 
and said that I had done her hair so cute. But I told her that I didn't and couldn't do that. I can't even regular braid her hair, much less do a perfect French braid. We asked our daughter how she'd gotten her hair fixed, and she told us that Betty had done it during the night. I broke the contract on that rental agreement and moved out within the next month. So, I'm a 23-year-old man, and I recently had an experience quite unlike any of my lifetime. I live in a community housing project. I would say it's half a hotel motel and half apartments. It's one building with three floors of maybe about 20 different studio bedrooms on each floor, and two other buildings with the same, except those are two bedrooms. That's neither here nor there, I'm just trying to give some perspective. I've been staying at this place for about eight months now. I haven't really had any problems at all. I wouldn't say this is a problem, not as of yet, but it is weird. Now, there was an old lady that stayed directly across from me. She must have had kind of a rough life because she broke down pretty badly mentally over time. Every night since I first moved here, I would hear her screaming and yelling and cursing literally having a whole entire conversations. Now this was weird from the start, but after a few days, I learned that she lives completely alone. I heard her literally making threats every night, sometimes crying and apologizing to someone. Now after a while, I actually ended up getting used to this behavior. Sometimes I would actually see her in the hall. No one ever talked to her. She would point at everybody and would say the most vicious, evil things to literally everyone. Our first encounter, I was met with the same treatment. I fake smiled it off and asked how she was doing. Ever since the death of my grandmother in 2014, I, for some reason, have an extreme soft spot and instant love for old ladies. Not in a weird way, just in like a how are you, let me help you with your bags, ma'am kind of way. I approached this lady in a similar fashion, and she seemed like she didn't know what to do with that and didn't know how to take it, but she never met me with the same aggression after that. Now, I have been here for eight months, like I said. Fast forward to just several weeks ago. By this time, this lady and I have crossed paths maybe nine to ten times. Briefly, but a few times. We never really had a conversation at all but I would always make sure that I spoke to her and acknowledged her. She didn't really show emotion, but a little gratitude. Now, every day, all day, she would still continue this manic-like screaming in her room. She very literally was sounding like an older, very angry, middle-aged man. Now, as I said, I was directly across from her, but we're also right dead at the end of our long, long hallway. And, to make things even better, I have a 10-hour shift job that I work 4-5 to five days a week. I'm working a 5pm to 4am shift. So just imagine, a long day of work. You get to your home, at the very end of the hall, almost isolated with this lady. At 4am we know it's very early, but very late also. It's still dark outside when I pull up to my apartments. It would be 4.30 in the morning, and this woman is still up, barking, growling, shouting, evil, haunting, and spooky stuff, sounding like a man. I swear this is absolutely not an exaggeration. Now on to the actually scary part. Right now it's 4.14 in the morning as I type this. I actually took a day off today, and I may take another just to wrap my head around what has happened in the last few days. Sunday morning, at around 6 o'clock in the morning, this woman was found dead in her room, right across from me. She wasn't killed, nobody ever came to see her or anything. She had no relationships as far as any resident here ever knew. A maintenance man would check on her at least once a day because, like me, he felt very bad for the old woman. When he checked on her this day, he had seen that she had passed and obviously reported it. She was found at 6 a.m., 
and they had her wrapped up and gone by 9 a.m. From what I was told, they say it was natural causes or side. They don't know which. Now, I spent that weekend at my girlfriend's place, so I wasn't present when whatever happened happened. I also had no idea that she had died. But when I returned to my apartment Sunday at 11.30 in the afternoon to noon, I walked the halls and for the first time in eight months heard no screaming. Now keep in mind, I have no knowledge of what has happened as I'm walking to my door. I see absolutely no one in sight. I turn and stick my key in and I hear a familiar voice. It's the old lady, but she looks much different. She looks cleaner and happy. Her hair wasn't all over the place from constantly running into walls, and she actually spoke clearly. She saw me and said, Hey, I was shocked at just that simple three-letter basic greeting from this woman. Honestly, with the events that transpired, I can't remember our exact conversation verbatim, but it was literally the happiest and best I'd ever seen her. It took me a few seconds to realize it was even her. At this point, my encounter with her was when it was approaching noon. Remember, she died at 6 a.m. But anyway, we had a brief conversation and I said, I'll see you later, ma'am. I'm a little tired, but you look beautiful today. She said, I'll see you again, young man. She said this and walked back into her apartment. It was something about her. She had a certain glow to her a certain force and energy that I had never felt before from her. But anyway, now at this time, I think nothing about it, and I go into my house and shut the door to use the restroom. A lady from the rental office who I'm close with and look up to as a godmother came and knocked on my door. Her name is Miss Tate. I opened, and she asked me how I was doing. I said, I'm fine, chillin', you know, the usual. She had a very horrified look on her face and sad look. She said, have you heard about the incident? I said, no, what's going on? She says, the woman across the hall from you, she took her own life this morning. Now I look at her and say nothing for legitimately 15 seconds. I ask, are you talking about the screaming lady across the hall? She says, yes. I ask, are you sure it was her? She gives me a really confused look before quickly saying, I saw that lady with my own eyes, sweetie. I say, I saw her with my own eyes too, just 15 to 20 minutes ago. Miss Tate, I don't know if this was supposed to be a joke or whatever, but you need to give it up. She looked dumbfounded, and we nearly had a really bad argument. I said, let's go to her room right now. She repeatedly says, I'm not going, you can go all you want. She said that she was never going in that room again. Miss Tate finally cooled down and showed me all the proof and paperwork, and now I'm literally at a loss for words. I never even got to know that woman's name. Miss Tate told me that she suffered from extreme schizophrenia and dementia. Also, she had a very sad last half of her life. I'm still not entirely sure what happened to me. Can somebody please explain this to me? I want to think that there's some natural explanation to this. But if not, I guess I saw a ghost. My mother went to Eastern Washington University and stayed in one of the houses the locals rented out to college students. I can't give the exact age of the house, but it was old enough to have a built-in button on the floor that would call up the servants to the attic, so the house was relatively old. During her studies there, she had three different roommates. My uncle was the first, who then was replaced by my mother's best friend, who was then replaced by my father. All three of them can confirm strange happenings in this house and being woken up in the middle of the night with people whispering. The worst of it was in my mother's room in the attic. My mother hated that house, but she didn't have anywhere else to live and the dorms were expensive, so she sucked it up and lived there until she graduated. She hated sleeping alone. 
The air in her room constantly felt thick and heavy. Her closet was constantly freezing cold, and at night, she would hear multiple people whispering incoherent words all at once. While living there, my mother had a cat named Puss, like Puss in Boots, who would constantly hide under the bed. One time, my mother caught the cat out from under her bed, sitting, watching, and growling at one of the corners of the room. My mom went over to the cat, confused at what she was looking at, until she saw a black figure in the corner slowly start to move upwards toward the ceiling. Puss started to become more aggressive, her hissing and growling getting louder before she freaked out and shot off back under the bed, still growling at the corner until the figure was gone. My mother had never seen the cat act like this, since she was usually a very loving and happy cat, but whatever that was clearly terrified her. Sometime later, my mother was talking with a friend who was excited to be touring two famous paranormal investigators around the college in town showing them supposedly haunted places. My mother brought up the fact that she has always had weird things happen in her house and thinks it might be haunted. Her friend got all excited and begged her to let him bring them to her house. My mother refused since she wasn't willing to stay up late for some people she doesn't even know. My mother didn't know at the time who these investigators were since she never really kept up with paranormal stuff believing that doing so can let evil into your life. She only knew that they were on quite a few popular talk shows at the time. It turns out that these two investigators were Ed and Lorraine Warren. Around midnight, my mother's best friend comes to her and tells her that there are people at the door who want to speak to her. Confused, my mother put on a robe and went to the front door. There she saw her tour guide friend with 12 other students behind Ed and Lorraine Warren. Lorraine asked my mother if they could come in as their guide had told them that it was possible her house was haunted. My mother agreed and let them all in. Lorraine asked my mother where in the house the haunting was more active, and my mother told her that it was in the bedroom, that she would take Ed and Lorraine there but everyone else had to wait. They agreed and my mother took Ed and Lorraine to her room. When my mother entered the room, she sat on her bed and asked if they could feel it how heavy the air was. Ed and Lorraine agreed that the air was heavy. Lorraine walked around the room to the closet and asked if she could hear voices here. My mother broke down crying and said she could hear them every night and that it kept her up at night. Lorraine told her it was possible that her closet was a doorway for people who had passed on or a doorway to hell. My mother continued to cry before Lorraine came over to her and told her that the reason these things are happening is because of her mom's family, that the women have some connection with those beyond, and that it's possible that they are psychics, which makes the dead more attracted to her. My mother then told Lorraine about the black figure, which Lorraine told her wasn't from this house, but was connected to her family, mainly on her dad's side, and that it was most likely something that went after her grandfather, her father, and now her. The figure wasn't a ghost or a demon, but just something that was pure evil and wanted her. Fearful, my mother asked them if they could bless her room, which they did, and after further investigation of the house, Ed and Lorraine told her that her house was the first place that actually showed activity and signs of a haunting in the whole area. After they finished blessing the house, Ed and Lorraine left. Time passed and my mom's best friend moved out and my dad moved in. The activity in the house still continued even after the blessing. At first, my father was skeptical of the house being haunted, until one night while sleeping in my mom's bed, he heard the whispering. He asked my mother what she said, and she told him she didn't say anything. After a few moments of silence between them, she asked if he could hear them. Confused, my father asked what she was talking about. She said, the whispering. He then agreed that he heard the whispering and asked where it was coming from. She said that it was coming from the closet and that it happens every night. Sometime after, my father got curious about whether or not that servant's bell still worked. Originally, no one had ever been up to the attic. Both of my parents made their way up to the attic, but never reached the top. Since on their way there, both of my parents felt like they couldn't breathe 
as the temperature dropped into the freezing ranges. My mother started to panic, and she felt like she was being choked. She quickly told my father to turn back around, because it felt as though they weren't wanted up there. Not wanting to upset my mother even more, my father agreed and turned back around, never to go up there again. Once my mother graduated from college, they moved out of the house, and strange events continued to happen no matter where they moved. Around the time that I was born, my parents lived in a rather small house with my two older brothers. Constantly, our cats would freak out, growling and hissing at the corners of the house. Not only that, but my mother would constantly see this black figure around the house. Later, my family had our new house constructed and we moved out of our old one. These strange events followed us and got worse. One day when I was around five, I was walking outside my room to walk downstairs. The moment I walked to the balcony, I felt somebody grab my arm extremely roughly. I turned around and all I see is this black figure holding my arm. I scream for my mother. My mother comes running up the stairs and she sees the figure. She grabs my arm and tries to pull me away, but the figure will not let me go. She pulled as hard as she could and ripped me away from it. As she does this, the figure disappears and a giant hand mark is left on my arm. My mother runs downstairs and screams at my father to get my brothers and that they were leaving the house until it was blessed. We later had a priest come to our house and bless it. Afterward, the activity stopped, but growing up, my second older brother and I would constantly have nightmares of this figure in our dreams, doing awful things to us. But in our dreams, it had bright red eyes and would chase us. Nothing else has happened since then, and I still live in the house. But every once in a while, I get this sudden fear from the staircase. I never go downstairs at night without the lights on, out of fear that this thing is possibly still here. I had spoken to my mother about the dreams and stuff that happened to her, but she tries to avoid talking about it since she believes the more we talk about it, the more it will come back. She has told me, though, that she spoke with my grandfather about this figure. He refused to talk much about it, since the first time she brought it up, he went pale as a ghost. He said that figure used to torment him as a child, and his dad would tell him about the figure and how it would come for him as it did with my grandfather. My mother didn't realize that it was Ed and Lorraine Warren until we were watching a documentary about them. She points to them and says, those are the ones that came to my house. I was speechless and she was confused. I told her that they were the Ed and Lorraine Warren, the most famous paranormal investigators ever, pretty much, that they were the ones who started publicly doing paranormal investigations and that there are famous horror movies that involve them. My mother freaks out and tells my father about it, and while my father was shocked, he didn't think much of it. I'm sorry if this story is a little all over the place, but it's the best attempt I have to explain my mother's story and my experience, since my mother doesn't like to talk about it much out of fear. After retiring from the service in 2009, I was in Iraq working as a contractor. My job entailed traveling all over the country, making sure specific things got done. Sounds like a lot, but it really wasn't. In the end of August of that year, I was detailed up to Mosul. I traveled, worked out the issues, and on the way back, I was directed to go through Balad to hitch a ride to Baghdad. While waiting for the ride in the air terminal, there was a battalion of army support folks who were also traveling. Many of them were sick, coughing and hacking up a lung. I tried to stay as far away from them as I could. My travel continued without them, but I was to live to regret it. A week later, I came down with swine flu, thanks to all that coughing and hacking. I went to the doctor on post, and because I was retired military, I was seen. He said that I was to immediately go into quarantine. My barracks did not have individual bathrooms, so I was led to the truck by my buddy, 
and driven the five miles to the other side of the base complex to Camp Liberty. I was sent down the road past the PX, on down to the right-hand side past the Y, if you have been there you will understand, and almost to the end of the road, two large campsites short, down by the wreck yard, where they brought all the destroyed vehicles. Then, way back, to almost the eastern outside wall of the camp. I was one camp short of the wall. The camps were about 20 trailers long, all surrounded by concrete T-walls. You could drive between the rows. Then, ten of those rows wide made up a camp, with a large space to drive semi-trucks between each camp. My hut was the one on the end. It connected to another living space through a shared bathroom. My buddy kicked me out of the truck and I walked between the T-walls up to the door and opened it. The dust on the floor didn't bother me at first. Everything is dusty in Iraq. My buddy followed me in and we looked at the dusty, dusty accommodations. I walked over and flipped the mattress over to a clean side and sat down. The room had a desk, a walk-in closet, and the shared bathroom. It also had an air conditioner that, when turned on, pumped out very cool, sweet-smelling air. It was then when I noticed the calendar hanging on the wall, July 2007, two years before. My buddy told me that he would go and pick up my poncho liner and laptop that was in my day pack so that I could watch movies while I waited out my seven days of quarantine. He also told me that he would bring me meals during the days that I was staying there. I thanked him, and he left. It was mid-afternoon, and I was tired, so I laid down and tried to breathe while resting, feeling sick as a dog. It was then in the quiet that I thought I heard someone talking outside. I couldn't catch the conversation, which bothered me some, as I couldn't hear if they were speaking English or Farsi. The hut door was locked, and I went on through the bathroom to see if the other hut door was locked, which it was. I kept the lights off so that nobody would know that I was there and come looking. When my buddy came back, I told him what had happened. It was getting dark by then. He had brought my laptop, poncho liner, and as an afterthought, he included a nice tanto knife I traveled with as I was not supposed to have a firearm for some reason. He left and I curled up in my poncho liner, and soon I was fast asleep. I woke later that night sleeping on my side facing the wall. It had grown quite dark in the room. Still facing the wall, I could hear voices speaking quite softly, but this time distinctly. You ask him. No, you ask him. At this point, I was wide awake and staring at the wall. Did I forget to lock the door? Who was in here with me? Something kicked the bed frame, and I thought somebody was trying to figure out why I was sleeping in their room. So I rolled over and looked around, but no one was there. I got up and checked the doors and under the bed. You could say that I was somewhat shaken by the encounter thus far. After everything was checked, including the closet, I turned on the closet light, but I left it cracked open a bit. So I was in the shadows in the room, and the room was light so I could see the rest of it. If somebody was messing with me, I was not going to take it. I was sick and feeling pretty crappy and just over it. This time I wrapped up in the poncho liner facing the room. Things got quiet after a while, so I drifted off to sleep. I was awakened again about an hour later by these same voices asking the same thing. Only, this time, a voice stated clearly, I'll ask him. It was at this time that I was laying on my back, and something climbed up onto my bed and sat on my feet like you would do during the sit-up event for PT. Needless to say, I was wide awake, and they had my full attention. With a sharp intake of breath, what or whoever was sitting on my feet jumped off. I sat up, and there was nobody in the room that I could see. The smell in the room, which was cool and dusty, turned into a sharp, burned smell. I thought it was coming from the air conditioner, so I got up to check. When my back was turned, I heard the voice say distinctly, Ask him. 
I told them in my best SGM voice to stand easy and I would be with them in a minute. I walked to the door and went outside, leaving the door open. It was early morning and around 4 a.m. The sun was just starting to light up the sky. I sat down on the steps and waited for my buddy. At 6 o'clock a.m. he showed up and looked at me strangely, asking why I was out on the steps as he handed my breakfast to me. I told him we were leaving. He laughed and said, no, you have six more days of quarantine. Go back inside and relax. I looked at him and said, no, I'm good. He found me sitting in the shade of the tea wall for lunch, same for dinner. He was starting to wonder what was going on. I told him, I'll tell you if you take me away from here. He just laughed as he drove away. The same thing happened to me that night, and more. The next day, I was sitting on the steps when four soldiers carried a private by the legs and arms into the room next to me and flung him on the bed. They dropped a box of MREs and a 12-pack of water and laughing said, Later, loser. I stayed outside till around 2300 hours, and then I went in and prepped for the nightly activities. The following morning at about 5 a.m., I was sitting out on the steps when the door to the other hut burst open and a very scared private ran out. He looked left, then right, breathing pretty hard like he had just run a marathon. I smiled at him and said, how's it going? He sat down and tried to light a cigarette, but his hands were shaking so badly he couldn't light the match and gave up after a few seconds. I could tell he was pretty shaken up by something. He looked right at me and said, D did you? I said, you met them too, I see. And he calmed down a little. I said, I don't think they're gonna do any harm to you, but it is a little unsettling. He said, yeah, I'm leaving. They can't make me stay here. I laughed and said that I had four more days and could use the company. His mind was made up and when it got light, he went and packed up all his stuff and left. My buddy was true to his word, and each day he brought me breakfast, lunch, and dinner like clockwork, each time finding me sitting on the steps or in the shade with the door open, waiting. Finally, on the last day, he came by for lunch and said, time to leave so we can go get pizza. I had all my stuff packed and shut the door and jumped in the truck. He asked, now are you going to tell me what's going on? I told him, not until we are far away from this place. We drove over to the belaying office to give the key back. We went inside and had to wait as a tall, muscular Army CW4 was chewing out one of his soldiers. He was not in a good mood. When he was done, I walked up and introduced myself as the guy staying in the quarantine hut. He asked if there were any problems as he reached out for the key. I looked him in the eye and as he grabbed the key, I hung on and said, Chief... You need to cut that key and the key to the other side of that hut in half and never issue it to anyone again. He was not amused, asking if anything was wrong with the hut. I said, you just go and spend one night there and you'll understand why I'm telling you to cut those keys up. He got pissed and took the keys. I left with my buddy looking at me like I'd lost my mind. At pizza an hour later, I told my buddy what had happened that whole week, leaving nothing out. He thought I was full of crap. A week later, I was walking through the PX at Camp Liberty, looking at all the pod over items, thinking if I could use another t-shirt with a slogan on it, or a new 501 shirt with my buddy in tow, when down the aisle, I see the chief running at me. He grabs my arm and says, I cut the keys in half. I cut him in half, and no one under any circumstance will stay in those huts ever again. This shocked and surprised my buddy. The chief said he was pissed at me when I turned in the key, thinking I had trashed the place. We went over to check it out. It was getting dusk when he left. He found the rooms neat and tidy, but also found them, and they wanted to talk with him. I later learned that the camp was handed over to the Iraqi army, I always wondered who got those rooms, and just how that went for them. In summary, I think it was a unique experience. 
I think that there were approximately seven to ten distinct individual entities present at any given time during my stay. They never followed me outside or into the bathroom, which was nice of them. They did go from room to room where people were staying, making themselves known. It was usually in the late evening to early morning, usually gone before the sun was up. I felt that I couldn't really help them, but I did tell them that they were quite possibly dead and that they needed to move on. I didn't get any names from any of them. It just seemed that it wasn't important to them to tell me. It was more of a can you see me and do I exist type of experience. I've thought on this many times and I've told a few people. Most think it was made up because I was sick. I don't think so. Usually when I'm sick I dream about fly fishing in cool mountain streams, not ghosts chatting with me. The private and the chief were also involved, and I didn't know either of them before I was sent to quarantine. And when the chief was in there he wasn't even sick. So, who knows? I used to clean offices back when I was a student going to university. It was a great job for students because they didn't really care when you showed up. As long as you got the job done between the closed hours of 6 p.m. and 6 a.m. This one law office I cleaned every Thursday was pretty cool by design, but it always spooked me out. The building was about six stories high, and the law firm being on top had a beautiful view. It was a heritage building, located in what was the city's original town square. I was told that it was where the town hangings had once occurred, and the particular building I worked in was at one time a brothel. So lots of history, and that history alone made me want to get the job done as early as possible. The whole sixth floor would usually take me about an hour to clean. I usually managed to be out of there by eight or nine at the latest usually taking a beautiful sunset, too. This night I had stayed late at school and arrived at the job well after dark and close to midnight. The layout of this law firm was a circle. You take the elevator up with your cart and the doors open to a reception and waiting area. To the right were the washrooms and then individual law offices circled around the floor with a large boardroom in the middle and a staff break room at the opposite end. A strange feeling usually hit me as soon as the elevator doors opened. This weird feeling of someone there, but the stillness of the vacant space kept reassuring you that that was crazy talk. The later in the evening it was, the stronger the feeling. I was not looking forward to this next hour. This night, the doors opened and I could hear people talking and laughing. It sounded like ladies were working late and chatting it up in the break room. I remember smiling with relief because I was feeling pretty scared to be there alone so late. I walked around the right side calling out hello to let them know that I was there and to not surprise them. As I rounded the corner to the break room, the talking sounds just stopped and absolutely no one was there. I stood there frozen for a moment and thought maybe they were in the offices on the left. So I kept going. I kept calling out hello and announcing my presence. No one was in the building at all, but the chatter that I had just heard was clear as day. As I came full circle back to the elevator, I kid you not, the elevator doors opened by themselves. I was so frightened that I just pushed the cart back onto the elevator and went home. Nope, nope, nope. My family and I have always been animal lovers. I've never known a time when we didn't have cats or dogs with us, and I feel like they helped raise me. When my father was in college, he adopted two cats named Tigger and Sato. Tigger passed away due to a coyote, and after she passed, Sato was never the same. She was grumpy and preferred to be by herself. 
but I would annoy her with my love anyway. One night, I was carrying her in her wicker basket with some blankets. I would bring her room to room as I cleaned up everything and did my normal things. I'd been petting her and listening to her purr when she suddenly stopped moving. I was maybe 12, and I remember praying for the first time to bring her back to me. It was awful to bring her out to my mom and tell her she had passed. I had a tradition whenever a pet died that I would make a concrete headstone with little marbles and their names on them. I had it set out on our kitchen counter to dry and left it there. The next morning I checked on it and found a small piece of her fur right in the center. I went around to everybody and asked if they had placed it there, and they all said that they hadn't. I felt like she was giving me one last piece of her. I kept it in a tiny knick-knack tea kettle, and it lives there with a few of her whiskers I found weeks following her passing. In a way, I think she gave me one last gift. When I was a young kid, had to be around four or so, we lived in a small house in Florida. My parents had bought the house right before I was born. I vividly remember going into my bedroom one day and sitting on my bed. There was a window directly across from my bed and the sun was shining through it. I remember pulling out a blue notebook that I loved. It had stickers all over it and I started to draw. All of a sudden, I remember getting up and walking into my closet. I have no idea why I got up and went into my closet, but once I'd gone through the door, I wasn't in my closet. I was walking down a path made up of pebbles, and all around me were tables with yellow umbrellas, like patio tables that have the hole in the middle for the umbrella. The sun was shining brightly and people were talking and laughing and I could hear water splashing. For some reason, I remember feeling really happy and excited about this cool place. I couldn't see a pool, but I could hear the water and the splashing, and see these tables with the umbrellas and even feel the sun. I loved going to the pool, and everything felt safe, and it was so sunny, and I felt really happy. I look up to see a man on a very tall chair. He looked down at me with the kindest eyes and gave me a little wave. I remembered that I waved back, but I started to look around, curious as to where I could go swimming too. The next thing I remember, I was back sitting on my bed and the sun was still shining in the window and the notebook was on my lap. I felt so sad and disappointed. Being four, I went out of my room and found my mom and demanded to know if we used to have a pool and tables with yellow umbrellas. I remember this as clear as can be. She paid me very little attention, but laughed and said, no, we never had a pool or tables with an umbrella. I remember being super disappointed that there was no cool water park or whatever that I could access from my closet. Fast forward many years, many years, to when I was grown and married with two kids of my own. We had moved to Texas when I was a teenager. My mom and I are looking through old photos and there's a picture of our house in Florida taken from the outside. My mom says something like, do you remember much about that house? I said, yes, actually, I remember a lot about living there. She says, your dad and I bought that house from a lady whose husband had died. He had been a lifeguard and actually wound up saving someone and then promptly had a heart attack right beside the pool. The memory of going into my closet at four years old did not immediately return to me. I had all but forgotten about it and probably chalked it up to being a dream. But later it hit me. My mom had never told me about the lady she bought the house from. Not until that moment when I was much older. The whole thing came back to me and how I couldn't have been asleep. I remembered the bed and the window and the notebook so clearly. I also remember feeling so excited about what I was seeing and so disappointed when it went away. Looking back, the tall chair I saw had to be a lifeguard's chair. It was crazy, and to this day, I have no explanation. I 
I have never had any kind of supernatural experience, and I'm generally a skeptic. But something happened that gave me chills. My wife and I live in a newly built home that we built, and we have infant twins. They sleep in the same room, but in separate cribs. They sleep roughly from 7.30 at night to 6.30 in the morning. We leave on a relatively silent humidifier, a baby monitor, and a white noise machine. Recently, Twin B was having a rough night. He was constantly awake and screaming. Normally, he sleeps well. We kept going in and settling him, only to have him wake up again shortly after, crying. At around 2 to 3 a.m., he woke up again. Neither my wife nor I immediately got up. I just thought I'd see if he'd cry it out in a little bit. At that time, I heard a very distinct shh from the baby monitor. I was so tired that I thought I either imagined it or it was the white noise machine, although this sound was very distinct from that machine. The next day, later in the day, my wife mentioned to me that she had a bit of a fright because she heard shushing coming from the baby monitor and thought that I was in the nursery. But then she looked over and I was sleeping beside her. I told her I heard the exact same thing. I actually hadn't really thought about the incident until my wife told me this. We both heard it. The baby monitors are not on Wi-Fi and we live in a pretty rural area. I'm sure there's an explanation, but this is the first time in my life that I've actually had chills from an occurrence like this. Twenty-five years ago, I moved in with my cousin and her roommate and co-worker named Jose. The house was an old cement block, three-bedroom, one-bath house with a large fenced yard. He had two very large German shepherds that lived there and were mostly in the yard. The house is in Carmel, Florida, in a shitty, packed, suburban neighborhood. Nothing special. Rent was cheap. Fifty bucks a week, from what I remember. And the house was clean. Plus, my cousin lived there too, so I moved in. We all got along well. Everyone worked. We pretty much kept to ourselves and saw each other for a few minutes here and there. I lived there for about six months. This is the story of what caused me to move out. On a weekend night, we all happened to be off from work. We decided to invite some friends over from the pool hall that we frequented, and Jose invited some people over that worked at the pharmaceutical lab. There were probably 20 people there total. We played music and did what young people do. Eventually it got pretty late and we found ourselves talking about ghosts. We all shared stories. My cousin and I came from a pretty spooky family, so we had some good ones. And everybody was really into the discussion. Jose was quiet throughout most of the conversation. He waited until we had all kind of quieted down. And then he said, You know, this house is haunted. My cousin and I shot each other a look, and then both laughed because, yeah, sometimes Jose's 20-pound house cat would meow at the empty hallway, but other than that, that was it. He proceeded to tell us that there was a presence in the house, but that it mostly stayed in the shed in the backyard. This tiny little pink wooden shed that I had never even looked in. He told us he always keeps the curtains in his bedroom closed because his window faces the shed and the door to the shed will not stay shut. He has jammed it shut a million times and it always pops back open. It creeps him out. He said he could tell when it was in the house because he would wake up feeling depressed. It creeped me out. I didn't want to think that I lived with a presence and I didn't like the idea that it was hurting my roommate. I was a tough chick in my opinion, so I was like, screw that ghost. I'll shut that door, and you won't have to keep your curtains closed anymore. I said all this because in my heart, I didn't really believe that anything was in the shed or the house. I believed we were all just messing around. So, I told them all that I was going to go outside to inspect the shed and deal with the door. Everyone followed me, and while we were walking around the outside of the house, Jose told me that it was a really bad idea to mess with the shed, 
that whatever it was wanted that door open and I should just leave it alone. We all got out there and it was exactly what I thought it was going to be. A very worn down wooden shed that oddly kind of looked like a tiny house more than a shed. I looked inside and there was a busted lawnmower and some old paint buckets, rusty screens, and darkness. I looked around outside and found some rusty shovels in a corner of the garage. I took a shovel over to the shed. I kicked the door of the shed back into the frame. The door was closed and literally kicked into the frame, kicked shut. I took the handle of the shovel and I put it under the handle of the shed door. I shoved that into the ground. It was secure. We all went back inside. We BS'd some more, but it was late, I'm gonna say around 1 a.m. by the time we go back in and everybody said their goodbyes. We let the dogs out of their pen in the yard and locked the gate. We made sure that the front gate was secured so that they wouldn't get out, and then we straightened up the house a little and eventually we all went to bed. Sometime around 6 a.m. I woke up because I needed to use the bathroom. I opened my bedroom door, and I was sleepy, but there was a weird sound as I opened it. It startled me. It was like fingernails scraping on something coarse. I opened the door all the way, and the shovel fell in the door and hit me. I can't even put into words how I felt in that moment. That shovel had been standing against my bedroom door from the outside, and there was a tiny pile of dirt where the tip had been sat against the tile floor of the hallway. I rushed through the house to the side door, which was locked, and then out to the backyard. The shed door was wide open. I felt like I couldn't breathe. I ran back into the house. I immediately pounded on both Jose and my cousin's bedroom door. I was terrified and angry because I knew, I mean, I absolutely knew that one of them had done this. Now, I know that you couldn't have been there to see the reactions, but I promise you, based on them, neither of them did it. Jose literally broke down sobbing. He begged me to tell him I was lying. He begged my cousin to admit that she had done it. When neither of us took responsibility, he went to the store and got a bunch of religious candles, produced a rosary, and started trying to pray away whatever it was, or pray for me for being dumb. My Spanish wasn't even close to fluent enough to keep up with his prayers. My cousin, on the other hand, was pissed. She was ready to fight me. She was adamant that I was pulling a prank, cussed me up and down, called me a liar, said I was a child, that most of all, she didn't appreciate being woken up at 6 a.m. after a night of partying to be a pawn in my prank. When I knew that neither of them had put the shovel against the door or reopened the shed door, I was literally terrified. There was no way someone else got into the yard, passed the dogs, got to the shed door, opened it, got into the locked house and then put that shovel against my door. I didn't sleep there again without someone else in the room with me. Every moment spent there after that was beyond tense. We all kind of stopped talking to each other and Jose and my cousin ended up in a terrible argument over a button on the stereo of all things and she moved out within a week. It took me two weeks to find another place to live and I never went back. This is not my experience, but I heard it from my father firsthand, and it sure is scary as heck. My father spent most of his childhood years in the village, from elementary school to the third grade. This happened when he was like nine or ten years old, as he remembers. I need to mention that he was never a religious person or anything like that, but he had a very realistic perspective on life. He was definitely logic-based. He never told this incident to anyone other than his mother when he was young, but when he heard similar stories from his relatives from the village about that specific area, he believed that his experience was probably not a dream or a hallucination. My father's house was outside of the village and also on top of the hill. It was difficult to reach their house on foot, 
but there was a shortcut that goes around the hill, and people who knew about the shortcut would sometimes prefer to use that path. It was a pathway rather than a road, narrow but less rough than the other roads. Those who knew about this road also knew that the path was a bit uncanny. It didn't really have a very clean past. There's a story about that road that my father heard from his father. Four or more centuries ago, around when the Mongol invasion of Anatolia happened, Mongolians attacked this village and killed every living being in the village. They put their heads on spikes along the path. People used to call this place Kabatas because it is also full of steep and sharp little stones. It means rough stones in Turkish. The thing is, nobody would want to use this path if it wasn't really necessary. Again, because of its unpleasant past. One summer afternoon, my father started walking toward his house, and he opted for the shortcut because he had to hurry. The road wasn't that long and he could get there faster. There were even neighbors living in their own houses just beyond the bifurcation at the end of the road. He walked a little more on the stony road and then stopped. More precisely, he had to stop. A stony wall appeared right in front of him, a wall that had never been there before. Why would anyone build a wall on that narrow pathway anyway? He asked himself, but the path continued just behind the wall after all. It was like a newly knitted wall. His first thought was maybe the neighbors put it there, but why would they? Also, the wall wasn't very long. The height of the wall was maybe 150 to 160 centimeters, and the length of the wall was maybe 200 centimeters. But of course, that was beyond the height of my father, who was still a small child. Still, he figured that in two moves he could climb the wall and get over it. There was no passing from the right or the left of the wall, and as the weather started to get dark and stormy, he wanted to climb the wall and continue on his way in order to get home quickly. When he climbed the wall and gave his hand to where he thought the stones would be over, he realized that the wall wasn't done yet. No matter how hard he tried to climb up, he couldn't reach the top of it. It seemed ridiculous. He thought, maybe it's my shoes. Maybe they're not good enough to climb and reach the top. But he was sure that he'd been firmly on his feet when he touched the top that wasn't the top. He kept saying to himself, how is this possible? Why is it not ending? By this time he was tired of climbing. He had a growing sensation within him that somebody was watching him, maybe toying with him. He was starting to get scared. The sky was almost dark. He thought it would be bad if I fall. I would break all my bones. Even though he'd never been religious, he started to pray to God. Then he fell to the ground with a bang. The wall collapsed on its own, and my father was buried under the rubble. He couldn't get up from the ground. He thinks that he passed out there. A few hours later, my uncle saw my father lying there, a little boy half of his body under the stones. He picked up my dad and carried him home. He tells my grandma where he found my dad, and my grandma said, Oh, my son, were you so tired? Haven't you found another place to sleep than that cursed land? My father told her about what happened to him. There's a widespread belief in that region, especially expressed by the ancients, that if you are wandering alone in a deserted place like that, something will come and play games with you, like the short wall that never ends when you climb it. Short story, but my grandmother lived with us for a few years, and when she would visit, she stayed in our guest bedroom. Because of old age, she had trouble going up the stairs, so we installed a stair lift. My grandma hated it when anybody besides her used it. Being 10 or 11 years old, my friends and I thought it was fun, and they always wanted to use it. My grandma passed when I was 13. On my next birthday, 14, my friends all came over for my birthday party. Everyone lined up to use the stairlift. 
Since my grandma had passed away, it was no longer in use, and I figured, why not let them use it? I was standing at the top of my stairs, and my friends were at the bottom, with one person going up the stairs on the lift. That's when a ceramic framed painting suddenly flew off the wall and shattered. It was right outside the room that my grandma always stayed in. It was a painting hung in a way that you had to lift up a wire off of a nail in order to take it down. And the nail was at a sloped angle, basically pegging it to the wall. There's no way that gravity could have been the cause of this fall. I like to think it was my grandma coming back to say, don't use my stair lift because it was something that truly bothered her. Either way, it wasn't scary, but comforting, knowing that she was still around, looking out for and watching over us. In late 2014, early 2015, I worked offshore in Louisiana, and I lived in St. Bernard Parish. I rented a home there. My younger sister and her three young children were also living with me. She was having troubles due to her and her husband separating. I was only home half of the month because my offshore job required me to be out for a week and then home for a week. My sister would tell me while I was home, that she had a lot of weird things happening to her and her kids. She couldn't explain it, but decided that it was supernatural, as many of us do when faced with something we cannot explain. I also want to mention something I didn't find out until months later. The house I was renting had been completely underwater during Katrina, and an elderly couple drowned in it. The poor couple decided to stay and take their chances, as many did. St. Bernard Parish was affected more than any other parish near New Orleans, with reports of explosions near the levees. My sister would tell me that she and her kids were experiencing things like locked doors that would fly open and then close again. If anyone in the house was taking a shower, the lights in the bathroom would turn on and off again during the entire shower. I just chalked it up to her being nervous to be alone in the house. That night, as I lay in bed, I suddenly felt a weight pressing on my legs. I assumed it was my sister or one of my nephews. I raised up out of a half-sleep, certain to see either of them and see what was the matter. Instead, all I saw was a concave indentation at the foot of my bed, half on my legs and half on the bed. Being completely exhausted from the prior week, I moved my feet, pulling my legs up into kind of a fetal position. It wasn't easy to move them. The weight was as if a full-grown man was sitting on them. My room had a bathroom in it. I chose it specifically for that reason. Later that night, I got up to use the bathroom, and I heard a male voice say, Get out. Immediately after that, I heard a bang in the kitchen. Nervously, I slowly started to sneak toward the kitchen, using my phone's flashlight to navigate, taking care not to wake my sister and her kids in the room close to the kitchen. Well, apparently she also heard the noise and came out to see what it was. My garbage can, which was under the sink, had been thrown across the room, landing by the living room television. Seconds later, my oldest nephew ran out of his room crying and screaming, He's in our bedroom. He pushed me off the bed. I ran to the room that my sister and her kids were sleeping in, hoping to see nothing. Before I could even cross the doorway, I was knocked off my feet with a punch to my chest. Suddenly, everything we had sitting on the kitchen island began to fly off in all directions. I got to my feet and commanded my sister to help me get the babies. With one of the boys in my arms, I ran to my room to grab my phone and the car keys. When we entered, every single thing I had in that room was laying in a big pile on the floor. Books, bedding, even my television which had previously been attached to the wall. Needless to say, we got out of Dodge fast. We moved out the next day. While packing up our stuff, I called the homeowner and told him I was moving out. I told him the reason, and I expected him to laugh at me, but he didn't. 
he wasn't surprised at all, actually. I'm sure he's either been through it himself or has had other renters prior to me have the same encounters. I've never experienced anything like that before or since. My sister and I never spoke of it again. Anyway, that's my haunted story. Stay safe out there. I'm an air conditioning and electrical contractor who works with several realtors in my area doing repairs on homes in escrow. I've been in more than one creepy vacant house. This was in late fall of last year. By 4.30 p.m. it was already dark. The house was empty, but the lights were on and we proceeded to replace the furnace. My helper got a strange feeling, kind of odd, heavy, and I agreed that I was also feeling weird. This house is about 30 years old in a typical subdivision in the North Valleys of Reno, Nevada. I made the comment that a couple of times that afternoon, I thought I had heard footsteps down the hall. He said that he had heard some too, but didn't say anything. We continued to finish up when he pointed down the hallway. There was a figure of a man, but only from the waist up, transparent, entering the front bedroom. We both saw it, and he called out, Hey! Hey, you're not supposed to be here. We checked out the room, but it was completely empty. The window was locked. We looked throughout the house, but we were the only ones there. We picked up our hand tools fast and called it a day. I couldn't lock that house up fast enough and get out of there. The next day, I was talking to the real estate agent, letting him know we had finished up and that the permit inspection was set for the next week. I asked him if he had any history on the house. He explained that the former owner's daughter was selling the place. It seems her mother had died that spring of last year in the house, and a couple of months later her father had shot himself in the bedroom. He then asked me why, and I said, I'm just curious. He then tells me his client had told him that she had seen her father in the house while she was cleaning it out, and he thought she was just a little nutty. I kind of chuckled uneasily, and I never told him what we saw. When I was 20, oh so long ago, I had a very tiny apartment. It was one half of a duplex built in the 50s. My landlord was a distant cousin, so he knew the history of the property. One afternoon, after cleaning and doing laundry, I decided to relax with my favorite book and a cup of coffee. I was sitting on my daybed, the place was too small for a couch and a bed, reading while my coffee was brewing. The book was a hardback special edition that I had read so many times the spine was broken. That meant I could lay the book down, still open, and it wouldn't close. I hear the last gurgles of my coffee pot, so I put my book on the daybed, still open, get up and go get myself a cup of coffee. I turn around to go back to my bed, and I see her. She was in her twenties, wearing a long brown skirt and green top. The style of clothes and hair was late 30s, early 40s. She was sitting on my daybed with her legs tucked up under her in stocking feet, just a relaxed pose, and she was leaning over reading my book. She looked up, saw me, gave me an impish, oops, you saw me, grin, and disappeared. I just stood there staring at where she'd been sitting. I stood there so long that when I finally came back to myself, my cup of coffee was cold. I immediately called my mom and told her what happened. She was solid. I couldn't see through her. I first thought she must be connected to the property somehow, but the duplex and the surrounding area hadn't been built until the 50s, and her dress and hair were from an earlier time. I never saw her again, and I've had no other encounters of that type but I remember everything about it to this day. I wasn't scared. Nothing about the encounter scared me at all or made me feel uncomfortable. In fact, I lived there for a couple more years, and every night before going to bed, 
I would take that book and open it to a new page and put it on my kitchen table, just in case she wanted to keep reading. So first, a little context. My house was built in 1599 for a wealthy farming family. The house has had extensions from the Victorian era and most recently the 70s, but much of the original home remains. It was a couple of days ago, but I was in my living room, half watching the news and half on my phone. My dog, who is a very old and chilled greyhound, suddenly jerks up from the sofa and looks directly to our window doors, looking down at the garden. At the time, the curtains were closed, so I thought maybe he had heard a fox or been disturbed by a pesky fly or something. And because I know that dogs can sometimes sense ghosts, I joked, asking if Granddad had popped in to say hello. He was still staring, and then suddenly something tapped the back door quite loudly. Thinking it could be a fox, maybe, after the chickens, I stood up and opened the curtains and looked out. It was dark, but no fox. Then I heard it. It was almost like breathing. At first, I thought it was the dog, but as I looked at him, he was facing the other way now. Yet I heard breathing, quiet but inside the room. I thought I had overreacted, and it was my own breathing. So I sat down. Yet it persisted, and it got slightly louder. And then I felt dizzy. It was like it was getting more intense, yet not louder. It felt like that dizziness that you get when you stand up too fast after you've been sitting for a while. But that made no sense, as I had been on my feet and fine just moments ago. I don't know how to put it, but it got worse, and I could feel myself panicking despite my efforts to stay calm, which surprisingly did not work. And soon it was too much. I went out of the room and upstairs into my own room, and stayed there the rest of the night. What made it worse is that when I sat there trying to comprehend what had just happened, I heard footsteps right below me. When I was a six to seven year old, I woke up one night. I'm not sure of the time, I just know that Leno was on. I saw what I thought was my brother standing on our dresser reaching for my Batman 1989 piggy bank that came with the cereal. I was really proud of it because it had 12 whole dollars in it that I had been saving to buy a Ninja Turtle. I don't know what made me think it was my brother. We both have very dark brown hair, almost black, but whoever was on the dresser was blonde and was wearing pajamas neither of us owned. Oh, and was internally glowing. He was lit up in a dark room, but somehow it didn't cast any light. The room was totally dark. Anyway, I see this thing reaching for my bank and I think it's my brother trying to steal my money. I say, Joe, go to sleep. I wait a couple of seconds, still there. So I say it again and then again. On the third time, he turns and looks at me, still standing on the dresser. So I get even louder. Joe, go to sleep. And finally, when I'd really had it, Joey, come on, go to sleep. As I remove my blanket and turn on the lamp, it disappeared. I felt the blood leave my face and I let out a death scream. I ran downstairs to find my dad and brother watching Leno. I cried myself to sleep in my dad's arms, screaming about the ghost. That was the first and not the last time I've ever seen this stuff. To start out, I'm fairly skeptical of the paranormal. So, I don't really know what to believe, but the only stories that are even a little bit similar to what I experienced all seem to be paranormal. So, to give some backstory, my street and neighborhood are pretty quiet. 
especially at night due to the number of young families and elderly couples that live on my street, which makes staying up into the early hours of the morning more relaxing and also a bit cooler, knowing that I'm most likely the only person on my street that's awake. The only thing is that I've had some creepy experiences, like hearing noises or even seeing a few drug deals, but most of that can be chalked up to living next to a big forest with lots of wildlife or just some sketchy neighbors. But for the past week, I've been trying to find a logical explanation for the strange events that keep occurring. It started at 2 a.m. last Tuesday morning. I was just sitting in bed on my phone with my earbuds in, something I do almost every night. When I began to hear whistling coming from out my window, I took my earbuds out and began listening to the whistling, trying to come up with an explanation. Normally, I'm not scared by anything in my neighborhood this late, and to be honest, I get more excited that something's happening and I'm there to witness it. But this time felt different. I wanted so badly to get up, to look out my window, but I was almost paralyzed with fear. I don't know what came over me, but every minute that went by of this whistling, I felt the pit in my stomach growing larger. It went on for almost an hour, and for the entire hour I waited for that whistling to start a tune or a song I could look up, but it just kept whistling the same note in a strange pattern. It would whistle one note for a good minute, and then take a break for about 30 seconds, and then return with its one minute whistle, until about 20 minutes in, when the whistles got shorter and closer together, only to return to the original pattern after about 10 minutes. What was even stranger was that whatever it was, was pacing in front of mine and my neighbor's house up until it stopped and retreated back down the other side of the street. I heard it leave, and I almost immediately felt that pit in my stomach subside, and while I was confused, I decided I should just go to sleep before I scared myself even more. The next day, I asked my parents and even some of my friends that lived close by if they'd ever heard anything like that. Everyone assumed it was an animal, which made me feel a lot better, but I wanted a definite answer of what I had heard. I stayed up for hours that night researching types of animals that were local to my area and the noises that they made. I didn't find anything that matched. This only left me more frustrated that I had no clue what it was, so I continued staying up in hopes that I would hear it again, and that this time I would look out my window to see it. But with my luck, I never heard the whistling again, except lots of other weird things have been happening. After the whistle, I began hearing someone, or something, walking around in mine and my neighbor's driveways, and sometimes even our yards, very late at night. But whenever I go to check, I can't see anything. And then about two nights ago, I swear I saw a figure of a person lurking behind my neighbor's car. Then the night after that, I saw what looked like a flashlight in the woods near my house, and whatever it was that was holding the flashlight was running out of the woods. Then again last night, I saw a person crouching near my neighbor's car, just looking around. I thought I was done researching. I couldn't find anything about any animals, but now I've started researching any stories even close to mine, hoping that I'm either not alone, or even better, someone has the answer to the strange occurrences, because I would like to start sleeping at a more normal time again and not be worried about either a stalker or a poltergeist or something coming to get me in my sleep. I'm just very confused, and no one seems to believe me, so any insight would be greatly appreciated. Even just knowing that at least someone is listening is helpful. To give a little background, I am an American expat living in Ukraine with my wife and daughter. My wife is Ukrainian, and although we live in Kiev, she's from a remote village near the Polish border, where her parents live currently. It's a tiny village, overflowing with a rich, sad history. 
To paint a bit of the picture, some of the houses here are decrepit beyond anything you would believe. Over a century old, sunken into the ground, rife with decay. And yet, people still live in them. Well, if you can call that living anyway. Other houses are big and beautiful and built only in recent years. And there are vacant lots in between. It's a dying village in the middle of the forest. And year after year, its population gradually shrinks. The young children who grow into adults here either stay and slowly drink themselves to death, or tuck tail and run to the nearest big city as soon as age or opportunity can afford. But being so old and in the heart of Eastern Europe means that the people here have seen a lot. My wife's late grandmother would tell us her tales of the Second World War, and she'd usually begin with something like, the Nazis were gentlemen. They gave the children candy when they would come through the village, and they always paid for everything they took. She saw the Nazis come through, and the officers made her father's home their quarters. Her father was well off and spoke German. Then she saw the SS come through and root out the Jews, killing anybody they didn't like, including her own grandmother, because she wasn't moving fast enough. In her stories, she always seemed to make a very clear distinction between the Nazis and the SS. They torched the place to the ground. At the other end of the war, it was the Soviet army that came in from the other direction, pushing their way, smelly, stinking, swearing, and stealing as they went. Then, when things finally settled, it was a face-off between the partisan freedom fighters and the KGB, and it was the civilian villagers that took the brunt end of it all. So many things have happened to this little village, and as you might imagine, such accumulated history might leave quite a spiritual impression on the place. This piques my curiosity, and so I'm always asking my wife about the supernatural activities of the village. She's a bit averse to discussing it in general, because it totally creeps her out. But there are a few things I have gleaned. One, there is a strong belief amongst the locals in a forest being called Mavki, which are allegedly the cryptic embodiment of babies who died before being baptized. You don't go into the wheat field alone in the summer, or they'll tickle you, and if you laugh, they'll kill you. Number two, there were and are witches in the village. Think like shaman type folks and soothsayers whom people will pay money to for fortune telling or to cast a hex on someone who crossed them. My wife and her family have actually had some interesting personal experiences with them. Number three, amongst the old motorcycles, tanks, and other artifacts of war that still get dug up on occasion, there was recently discovered a Jewish mass grave on the outskirts of the village, no doubt a remnant of the Holocaust. And finally, there are a few haunted places in the woods and along the road in between the villages where strange sightings have occurred, or it suddenly becomes so cold that you can see your breath, or the cars will often just stop on their own and cease to work for a few minutes. That last point is relevant to the creepiest story she's ever told me. When my wife graduated from primary school into high school, she had to start traveling to the neighboring village to attend class. It was an eight kilometer bike ride one way, every day, rain or snow, and the road took her and many others directly through this creepy bit of darkness where cold spots appear in mid-July and cars suddenly break down without apparent reason. My wife would generally pass without incident, albeit holding her breath for those hundred or so meters. But one particular morning, she got to school and sat down with her classmates to wait for their teacher. And they waited and waited and waited. She never showed up. This was highly unlikely, as the teacher had a strong reputation for being very serious about her students, and not just showing up like this was extremely out of character. And so it was with this teacher the next day, and the next day, and for the remainder of the week. Well, after a week, the teacher finally reappeared. Mostly. She was more or less back to normal, but still not quite herself. She continued to leave the slightest impression of being frazzled, shaken by something as if she had just lived through one of her life's defining before and after moments. Whenever asked, she would outright refuse and wouldn't say a word about her absence. As the rumors began to circulate, 
the students caught wind that indeed something had happened to her on her way home from school the night before her unexplained first absence. But no one would breathe the detail. They would just quickly change the subject, call you an idiot for asking, or saying, no, we're not going to talk about that. And that was it. Life went on, and no one would ever talk about the strange week without the teacher. But someone had to know, and it turns out that the teacher confided in her coworker, who happened to be my wife's mother. Now keep in mind, in Western Ukraine, the sun will set as early as 3.30 p.m. on the shortest day of the year, so it's not an unusual thing to be riding home from school in the dark, which is precisely what my wife had to do most of her academic year, as likewise did this teacher. Cars were not common in those early post-Soviet days, especially in a remote village such as this one. So the teacher faithfully pedaled her way to and from work every day and night, as her duties dictated. On this particular night, she was cruising along the road, and she came upon the haunted track of road. About halfway through, she suddenly felt a large weight come down and sink the rear of the bike, as though someone had suddenly sat down to hitch a ride on the rack above the rear wheel. Before she could even react, a cold, growling voice whispered in her ear, don't turn around. That was it. I can only imagine how I would feel if I was caught in that same situation. I would be paralyzed with fear, and autopilot would keep those pedals moving for as long as they had to. As it happened with this teacher, she did just that. She carried that nameless thing on the back of her bike until she recovered her senses enough to pray. I don't know what she prayed, but if it were me, I might be able to squeak out just a please God or help me Lord or make it go away. And maybe she had to say it five or 10 or a hundred times, but she just kept pedaling and just kept praying. And then, as suddenly as it had sat down, the weight lifted, her bike returned to normal, and I'm sure she made the rest of her way home in record time. I do not know how much of this story has been embellished over time, or how many details have been tweaked until it morphed into a local legend. But there is one thing that everyone confirms to this day. Something happened that night, which freaked out an otherwise very calm and rational woman so totally and completely that she couldn't bring herself to come back to work for an entire week thereafter. And this was her explanation. To my knowledge, she had never claimed to have any kind of supernatural experience either before or after that incident. When my mom was younger, about six years old, she and her dad had fallen asleep on the couch. She was laying in front of him, so his back was facing the back of the couch, and my mom had her back toward him. She'd woken up in the middle of the night to see somebody sitting in front of her, leaning against the couch. At first she thought it was her dad, so she reached her hand out to touch him, but all she could feel was really curly hair, like an afro which her dad didn't have. She ripped her hand away immediately, knowing that it couldn't be anybody in her family. That's when she saw it start to turn its head, but before they could make eye contact, it disappeared. Creepy enough, right? Well, get this. My dad had a similar experience. When he was young, he was laying in his bed and had also been woken up in the middle of the night. The entity was sitting in the same position, sitting up with his or her back against the side of the bed. My dad thought it was his dog, so he went to pet him and felt the same curly, textured hair. He immediately ripped his hand away and kicked it in the head, but it popped right back up, and he just kept kicking it, and then it disappeared. When my dad met my mom, they'd been sharing their paranormal encounters, and as my dad was listening to my mom tell her story, and describe what she had seen and felt, my dad got this overwhelming feeling and immediately knew that when they were kids, years before they had ever met each other, they had encountered the same entity.
This happened a few years ago when I was in a taxi. I lived near a haunted road at the time. I was in the front seat and there were three women and a little girl in the back seat. The drive was pretty quiet, but the strangeness happened when the car stopped to let two of the women out. The driver collected the fare from the ladies and noticed that the little girl was no longer in the car. We all looked around and she was just nowhere to be found. There was silence for a moment before I told the driver to just go. The location where we stopped had no bushes or buildings to hide behind, just a bus stop. If she had snuck from the car to avoid payment, she would have had to run at least 100 to 150 meters in either direction, and do that silently in less than 10 seconds. I really doubt that's possible unless she is the most legendary ninja. What confuses me is, if she was a ghost, how did the women in the back not notice? Maybe she had an actual physical form? If it's not a ghost, then any ideas on what could have happened? I am still thoroughly confused. So, about a year or two ago, I was living in Dekula, Georgia with my older foster sister, who is 40, and five other foster siblings. My older foster brother, who is the same age as me, had started to tell me all about this ghost spirit that he had summoned. To let everybody know ahead of time, my foster brother was really into reading the Bible, and he wanted to become a preacher since we were really little. But one year, that all changed and he began to show some very strange signs. Firstly, he wasn't into reading the Bible anymore. Even when I mentioned to him how he had told us he wanted to be a preacher, he would deny he ever said that. Also, he had started to call himself the devil, and he told me how he wanted to watch the world burn. And yes, this was happening when we were in our teenage years, but I'm saying that I know he wasn't emo or just playing a joke. Anyway, moving on to the summoning of ghosts, between 2016 and up to August of 2018, my foster brother would continuously mention this ghost spirit. The spirit's name was Chris. Apparently my foster brother told me that he had found out how to summon him through a website, probably something off the dark web. He told me that this ghost was a war soldier that had died in one of the world wars and that he had left his wife and children to go and fight the war. Throughout 2016, even through 2018, I was kind of believing him. There were a few times when at night I would be sleeping in bed and I felt like somebody was in my room, like hiding in a corner or being at the end of the bed. And there were also times where we could hear small creaks upstairs when everybody was downstairs. Honestly, I don't think he was trying to troll us or just doing it to get attention. I honestly just have no clue. I was six years old at a funeral and I was just wandering around the church. Then this kid, who was about the same age as me, urged me to go into this basement to play with him. I used to keep Hot Wheels in my pockets, so we passed a car back and forth to each other on this weird table. Looking back now, it was probably the table a mortician used. He didn't talk much, but he was really hyper. He tossed the car really hard and it went off the table. I didn't want to catch it. As soon as he did that, it was like he dipped off into a corner, but I couldn't see him leave because I was looking for my Hot Wheel. I didn't hear any footsteps going back up or anything. He just vanished. I'm pretty sure I played with a ghost. So like six years ago, I lived in Orange Park, Florida, and our house had mold throughout it, so we had to move. 
I lived in that house my whole life, and I was really distraught at the thought of leaving it. Eventually, my dad and stepmom got my brother and I excited about the house that we had to move to, so we moved all of our stuff in. It wasn't a huge house. It had three bedrooms and an office, so it doesn't seem like the typical scary house. The first night there, I got to Skype my mom. At the time, it was very rare that I got to do that, and I told her about how I felt really uncomfortable in the new house. She proposed that it might have been a ghost or a bad energy. I didn't understand any of those terms at the time because I was only nine. She said that we should get someone to get rid of the ghosts. My dad overheard her say that and said she was crazy and made me end the call. My dad tried to make me happy and comfortable by putting a little family photo of us at the end of the hallway with all the bedrooms. That night I dreamed that there was a mosquito in my room, and my first instinct was to kill it. So I clapped my hands really hard on it, but I heard a really deafening sound of glass breaking. I woke up immediately and heard my stepmom in the hallway. I opened my door, and I saw that the family picture was on the complete other end of the hallway, and glass was all over the floor. I started then to think that the house really was haunted, but when I mentioned it to my dad, he would get extremely mad at me and send me to my room. Eventually, I started to become depressed. My dad and stepmom got married. Lots of times, our dogs would bark at the wall, but that's probably normal, right? Years later, I mentioned it, and instead of my dad getting mad, he told me that he hid a lot of things from me so as not to scare me. He doesn't believe in ghosts, but he told me that we rented the house from a widow whose husband died very recently before we moved in. He told me about how multiple times my stepmom would wake up to the sight of a man standing at the foot of her bed. It all makes sense, but I don't know how ghosts and stuff work. I'm trying to find some answers for how all of this happened. So if you know anything, let me know. So it all happened back in April of 2016 when I was 28. I'm a female and I was traveling with my parents and my younger brother, who was 22, to visit relatives in Hong Kong. We always stayed in this area called Sha Tin as it was easy for us to navigate the public transport to all the places my relatives lived from there. Mom found a really good deal for a 10-day stay at a hotel in the area. It was at a hotel we'd stayed at years ago, and while it was not as convenient as our usual place, it was a ridiculously good value for a four-star hotel. We arrived late in the afternoon and evening and checked in as normal. The first thing I noticed when we walked into the room was that it was a little shabbier than I had expected for a four-star hotel. When you walk in, on your left is one of those closets where you can hang up your coats and stuff, about two steps ahead on the right is the bathroom, and opposite that is a little nook where there's a teapot, tea and coffee, and the mini fridge. From there, the room opens up to a double bed and two single beds, a TV, a typical setup of a slightly larger hotel room. As soon as I walked in, I noticed that the closet light kept flickering on and off, even while the closet door was closed. I didn't think much of it because the room looked pretty old and I figured it was just poorly maintained. So having got off a long flight, I really needed to use the bathroom, so I headed straight there. When I stepped in, I was shocked to discover that the lighting in the bathroom had this horrible greenish tinge. The bathroom was a bit worse for wear, but not unusable. The corners were all dark and grimy, like they hadn't been cleaned for a while and there was slate loose in the ceiling that looked like somebody had kicked it in. With the greenish light, it had a really strong horror movie vibe about it. To top it off, as I did my business and while I was washing my hands, I had this distinct feeling of being watched. Not just watched from a distance, but it felt as though someone was standing really close behind me, with their head next to mine. Being tired, I told myself that I was just imagining things, finished up, and walked out. It felt so creepy though. I found myself literally shaking it off as I walked out. 
My brother went in after me, and he came out shortly thereafter. He gave me a look as if to say, What the heck? Realizing that he was as creeped out as I was, I nodded and simply said, I know, right? We both decided there was something off about the bathroom, but considering our parents seemed fine with it, and we were only going to be there for a few days, we just shrugged it off. Yeah, it felt a little creepy, but I figured that if we left it alone, then it would leave us alone. I mean, how bad could it be? The next few days were okay. Outside of the bathroom, everything felt normal. My plan was pee as quickly as possible, shower as quickly as possible, and stay the heck away from the bathroom unless absolutely necessary. The worst thing was really that the bathroom had this huge mirror that ran all the way from the entrance to the bathtub and shower. You could see yourself in this mirror all the time. Every time I washed my hands or showered, I had this overwhelming feeling that something invisible was staring back at me through the mirror. I can't explain it, but I just felt like if I didn't keep my guard up, at some point, if I looked away and looked back, I would see something that might scare the life out of me. One day, after we came back from shopping for gifts, I was super excited because we had shopped for baby clothes for my cousin's daughter who was about to be born. We were taking photos of all the clothes and toys we bought, and then I realized I needed to use the bathroom. As usual, I threw open the door and walked in, but I was practically floored because the green lighting was gone. The bathroom looked and felt super normal. I wasn't scared and I didn't feel creeped out. The mirror, everything felt fine. It was totally normal. I thought, oh my gosh, I really am nuts. I imagined everything the whole time. I finished up and went back outside to fuss over the presents some more. At some point, my brother was peering at the air conditioner control and he said, um, did you change the temperature? Confused, I responded, no. Mom? Dad? He asked. They both shook their heads. He called us over and startled. We noticed that somehow the temperature had been set to something ridiculously low. Mum brushed it off as a faulty setting and set it back up to where it was before. The key point here is that I have really, really bad asthma, which is triggered by cold temperatures and dry air, so we never set the air conditioning that low. My brother and I exchanged looks again, but we didn't say anything. On the way out to dinner that night, we were on the train, and my brother and I finally decided to tell our parents. But, horrifyingly, the situation was much worse than I expected. Turns out that while I had just been feeling creeped out, my brother had an entirely different experience. He said that on the first day, yes, he felt the same as me, like he was being watched. But on top of that, while he was showering, he thought he heard me call him by his nickname. Only our family calls him that. He actually answered, what? And when I didn't respond, he felt scared. He called my name and nothing. When he told us this, I vehemently denied ever calling out to him when he was showering. He said it sounded as though I was just on the other side of the door. I told him that my entire plan was to stay away from that bathroom at all times. I didn't even hover at the kettle area simply because it freaked me out to be close to it at all, so there was no way that I was going to stand there and call out to him. Then the next day, he saw what looked like muddy, dark, bare footprints next to the toilet. It freaked him out, but as we decided to just sort of live and let live for the next few days, he didn't say anything. Finally, the night before, he was showering. And when he glanced away and then back at the mirror, he saw a young woman with long, dark hair standing right next to the toilet in the mirror. He reflexively shut his eyes and said something to the effect of, Please stop that. It's really scaring me. He opened his eyes and it was gone. He also explained that he had this strong feeling that the young woman had once hidden under the space in the bathroom bench, which gave him and I the creeps. In retrospect, my parents and I started realizing a lot of weird things about the room, 
and the behavior of the staff around us. Realization number one, everybody knew but us. For example, one day we were pretty tired and decided to just chill at the hotel until late afternoon. The cleaner came by and we mentioned that we're happy for her to just collect the used towels and leave the new ones in the bathroom. This lovely middle-aged lady walked in and was friendly enough, albeit a little shy. We were all within view, but because the bathroom door was closed, mom said to her, Oh, it's okay. There's no one in there. The cleaner nodded and, weirdly, despite hearing my mom explain it already, knocked on the door before entering. My parents and brother and I looked at each other a little confused. Language was definitely not an issue. We speak the same language and had spoken with her previously. She left after giving us our daily bottled water refills and towels, and that was that. The daily bottle refreshes and the housekeeping was also weird. The beds always looked like they were made up really quickly, not with the usual type of care that you get at hotels. The refilled bottles were never set on the bedside tables like they usually are, but just dumped near the kettle, closer to the door. At the time, we figured it was just because the room was so cheap. Every morning when we left the room, any staff nearby would stare weirdly at us and smile awkwardly. This is pretty strange for Hong Kong hotels because we don't look different. Usually they just kind of ignored you and it's not like we're staying in some VIP room or something. I always thought maybe we just gave off heavy foreign-born Chinese vibes or something, but thinking back, I think they were looking to see if we were acting funny because they knew the room was dodgy. Realization number two. It was listening to us. When it called out to my brother, it wasn't by his real name. It was by the nickname we call him, and literally nobody else calls him that. Also, we had mentioned a few times in conversation how we needed to make sure that the air conditioner wasn't too low because of my asthma. It was summer in Hong Kong and incredibly humid, so my brother joked a few times about how setting the air con super low would feel better but might kill me. Realization number three, defying technology. Previously, when the air conditioner was set lower, it was set to about 11 to 13 degrees Celsius. We never keep ours under maybe 18. Well, we found out that the hotel air conditioning control does not go below 17 degrees Celsius. Most air conditioners don't in our experience. So when we saw the setting in the room, it made no sense. My brother said the reason he walked over there was because when I went into the bathroom, he swore that out of the corner of his eye, he saw a white mist hovering near the air conditioning controls. When he walked over, he noticed the incredibly low setting, and that's when he asked us about it. After listening to us, my mom went white as a sheet. She and dad decided that we would ask for a room switch immediately. It was the calling out to my brother and the air conditioner that freaked her out the most. In Chinese folklore, there are legends about ghosts wanting company. They would lure people to accidental deaths by scaring them or calling out to them. She was afraid that the ghost was trying to latch on to my brother, considering that he was the only one who saw or heard her. Mom also had a theory that given that I'm super protective of my family, it may have decided that I was in the way or I had pissed it off somehow. We figured that unknowingly, my excitedness and cheerfulness had offset some of the energy in the bathroom that day, knocking it out of its territory, which was why I suddenly felt like everything was normal in the bathroom. I had accidentally knocked her out of it or something. So because I pissed it off, it turned down the air conditioner as an attempt to mess with me, or maybe worse. When we went back and told the front desk we wanted to switch rooms, the young man at the desk looked slightly uncomfortable. My mom just explained, we're just very uncomfortable with the room. Look, we'd really like to change rooms. We're only here a few more days, so if we can't, we're happy to just check out now. The guy didn't even look surprised. Weirdly, without asking more questions, he just told us he would go ahead and change our rooms. He would give us a new key to another room on a different level and explained that once we'd cleared out of our old room to just come back and give him the key. To us, that was super weird, especially because he didn't even question it, nor did he offer to come up with us or check anything out. We didn't care though. We went upstairs and packed up all of our stuff. 
By this stage, I was freaking out inside a little bit because the gravity of what my brother had told us was sinking in. I told my parents to leave anything that didn't belong to us in the room. I had watched enough horror movies to know that these things attach themselves to objects, right? So I was like, leave the water bottles, leave the toiletries, we can get new ones. I even left my personal toothbrush in there. I wanted nothing that had stayed in that bathroom for a prolonged period of time with it. We checked into the room upstairs and were shocked to realize that everything we suspected seemed true. This room was exactly the same structure, but it was so much neater. The bathroom lighting was normal, still old and a little dirty, but no creepy vibe at all. The refilled water bottles were neatly placed on the bedside table, with the hotel cardboard tags attached. The beds were made properly, tucked in corners and everything. We realized that the other room must have been known at to be as haunted as we thought it was, so the cleaners would just rush to tidy up, dump whatever they needed to dump, and leave as quickly as possible. It also explained why the cleaner insisted on knocking on the door to our bathroom first before entering. In Chinese folklore, it's polite to announce yourself before you walk into a ghost's territory by knocking first on the door. The theory is that if they don't want to mess with you, they'll have an opportunity to leave or hide. Horrifyingly, Mom realized that she had accidentally left one of the drink bottles from the other room in her handbag. Calmly, she wrapped it in some Buddhist beads that she carried with her everywhere and explained, we'll throw it out tomorrow somewhere. Don't worry. I was a little scared, but my brother was just happy that we had left the other room. That night, while we slept, for no reason at all, I woke up. I had my back to the entry hallway of the room. I could see my brother in the bed next to mine, and I could hear both of my parents breathing and snoring in their sleep in the bed behind me. Despite this, I could feel someone watching me from the hallway. I was wide awake, and so scared out of my mind I could barely move. I remember being very aware of my own breathing. I told myself that I was just traumatized, and that if I just turned around, I would see nothing, and there would be nothing to be afraid of. So, I lifted myself off the bed and turned. There, standing in the darkness, I saw a silhouette of a person, medium height, standing right next to my mom's handbag, where the bottle was. I about crapped myself. I turned quickly around and pulled my covers up over my shoulders and wrenched my eyes shut. I don't know how, but I fell asleep. When we woke up in the morning, we went out for breakfast. Mom threw the bottle out in one of the shopping center bins, and afterward, nothing weird happened. This was one of the most frightening things I've ever experienced, and the residual effect of this meant that I kept running into all these weird things for like the next two years. I'm not sure if it was just trauma playing with my brain or actually something supernatural. Luckily, never has something that bad happened again. For reference, this place was called the Regal Riverside Hotel. I think we were on level eight and afterward moved up to nine. Neither of us remembers the exact room number. I think a part of me blocked it out. A lesson that we learned from this was that the cliché is true. If it sounds too good to be true, it probably is. There was a very good reason why that room was so cheap. I'd rather pay more money without this ever happening again. And it's the last time I will ever stay silent about creepy hotel rooms. Any sign of weirdness, I tell myself that I will change rooms immediately. I am currently looking for answers. A few years back, maybe four to six years ago, I believe I witnessed a ghost or spirit of some sort. Basically, I have a bathroom in my room, and the end of my bed faces the bathroom door. One night, I'm unsure of what time it was exactly, I woke up and saw a hand coming out of my bathroom door. The hand was completely black, and the hand was holding onto the front of the door. 
I am searching for answers as to what this could have been. My mom did tell me that we live near an old Native American burial ground that's about five minutes away. I can't confirm that that's actually true, and I have no idea if that would play into my experience, but I still would love to know what it was that happened. When I was 12, I woke up and opened my eyes to see a man standing on the edge of my bed, looking down at me. If you've ever seen the movie Insidious, he looked exactly like the person from The Further, or one of them. He had very short hair, almost balding, and was in tattered, out-of-date clothing that matched the era the others were wearing in The Further from the movie. He was stone still, with a grimacing smile, staring down at me. His head was cocked to the side. From my memory, he appeared all gray, body, clothing, everything. I was terrified and blinked a few times. I was absolutely frozen. He dissolved away slowly. I grew up in a house that my stepfather built, on land that has no historical significance or ties to any horrific happenings. I've never seen him again. Does anyone have any insight on what this encounter might have been? So three years ago, my wife and I moved into a house. It was built in the 80s, but it was in great shape and it didn't cost much. So we were excited for such a great deal. We bought it and started renovation on it, which lasted about a year. We moved in and for the first month or so, it was great. Well, one night while my wife was at work, I was laying in bed when I heard a little pitter patter. It was coming from the attic and the door was locked directly over my bed. I panicked. Being a believer in ghosts and stuff like that, I ran to the living room and slept there. The next morning I told my wife, who brushed it off as raccoons or something. She bought some traps and put them up there before going to bed. There were no pitter-patters that night, and in the morning there were no animals in the traps. She reset them and we left for the day. We got back late and went to bed. The next morning, she found a squirrel in one of the traps. Problem solved. She let it out, and we both forgot about it. Well, two months ago, it started up again. Every night this time. It sounds like something small running back and forth across the floor. Every time it happens, I wake my wife, who's a very deep sleeper. But it always stops the second she wakes up. She's never heard them, and she thinks that I'm crazy or that it's just animals again. We've set more traps, but we haven't found anything. My sister recently adopted a little girl, and when she runs, it sounds exactly like the noises that I'm hearing from the attic. I'm convinced that there's a little girl's ghost up in the attic. I've told my wife this, and she told me that it's nothing and to just forget it. But I can't. I heard it last night, and I know I'll hear it tonight as well. When I was a child, I used to see ghosts in our old apartment in Manila. Mostly, they were just blurry figures of a person that's just passing by. But one night, while I was watching late night TV, I saw a man standing on our stairs. The man was wearing all black and I could clearly see his face. I could even see that he was skinheaded, like bald. He didn't look menacing, he was just looking. I was so scared I nearly peed my pants. I told my mom about it, but she wouldn't believe me. My dad at that time was a delivery driver, so I barely saw him. We moved to another town after a few years. Decades later, while we're reminiscing about our life in Manila, I told my family how I used to see ghosts in our old apartment. 
My dad was shook and told us he used to see them too. He asked me why I didn't say anything. I said that I told my mom, but she wouldn't believe me, so I stopped talking about it. Without any prompting from me, my dad said, yeah, I used to see a black figure of a man on our stairs whenever I came home from work. My younger brother piped up and said that he also saw the same figure in our house. Then I told him that I could see him, and I clearly described how he looked. He thought originally that he'd just been too tired from work, but then he told us the rest of the history of that apartment, and who he thinks the ghost is. He told us he had to do some kind of ritual to cleanse it. A few years before we moved into that apartment, there was a tenant who committed suicide by hanging himself on that staircase. He was a nursing student studying for his licensure examination. He rented that apartment alone so he could focus, but due to the pressure from his father, who was a military man and would beat him, he decided to end his life. Ironically, I am now working as a nurse and my brother is in the military. We didn't know his story until this very year. I don't particularly believe in the paranormal, but I don't know if there's another explanation for this one. On a weekday, during the time of the lockdown, this was the time when students had to do all of their schoolwork from home. I was half asleep in bed and didn't get up for school, considering the fact that my alarm didn't go off. I laid there in bed for a while until I heard a knock at my bedroom door. I don't know the specific number of knocks, if that's relevant, but I know that I heard a woman's voice talking to me. Cody, wake up. It's 8.30. I assumed it was my mom because she's the only lady in the house. I looked at my phone to check. It was 7.30, an hour before I had to wake up to start school. I was still dazed from laying there for so long, so I replied, Ma, I still have an hour. About an hour later, I went to the table for breakfast, and when my mom walked in the room, I brought it up. She looked at me confused and then answered my question. I never went to your door. I was walking the dog at that time, like I always do. This was when it hit me. That female voice at the door didn't sound anything like my mom. I had just assumed it was her. I shrugged it off by the time I had to show up for class. But during the break between the Zoom meetings, I soon realized something. Whoever that was, why and how did she know my name? Later, when all my classes were done, I told my family what had happened. My older brother just brushed it off and said I was probably still dreaming which didn't make much sense because it felt so real, and everything I came into contact with, I could feel. Meanwhile, my dad just frowned at me. Did you respond to it? That's all he asked, and when I confirmed I did, he went on a rant about spirits and ghosts. My dad very much believes in this type of thing, and whenever we bring up this topic, he always mentions that he has a sixth sense. All he told me was that it's a bad thing that I responded, and it's even worse that whatever it was knew my name. So yeah, that happened. I just find it odd that whoever or whatever this thing was only did it once and never came back. It was late afternoon a couple of days ago, and I went to put my two-week-old baby girl down for a nap in her bedroom. I had been up all night taking care of her, and I had been doing laundry and other chores all morning, so I was pretty tired myself. My husband ran to the store to get some groceries, so I decided to take a nap while Natalia was sleeping. I grabbed the baby monitor and went to lay down in our bedroom across the hall. I always make sure I grab the baby monitor whenever I'm going to lay down, since I have two sleeping disorders and I sleep hard, so I don't always hear her cries when she needs something. Anyway, I decided to read a little bit before napping. All of a sudden, I hear a bunch of static coming from the baby monitor. I ignored it and continued reading, figuring that as long as my daughter wasn't crying, I could just ignore the noise. 
Amanda, Amanda. I heard a kid's voice quietly say the name over the baby monitor. I froze. Did I really just hear a child call me over the baby monitor? I instantly felt creeped out and like something or someone was watching me. Scared, I ignored the voice. I heard the static again and the same voice say, come here. Still very creeped out, I went across the hall to my baby's room. I saw my sweet girl laying in her bassinet, quietly looking at me walk through the door, almost as though she was waiting for me to come to get her. Quickly, I grabbed my daughter and left the room. I'm not sure if she was communicating to me through the baby monitor somehow. As I mentioned earlier, I do have two sleep disorders, so I'm not always very good at hearing her cries when I'm sleeping. So I'm not sure if this was a way of her signaling to me that she needed something before I fell asleep. But I don't think she could really say my name. Maybe there was something in her room that was communicating to me. And plus, I was reading. I wasn't even asleep yet. I've never felt any malevolent spirits in our home. But I did feel on edge after that experience a couple of days ago. I haven't experienced anything else since, though. I just have no explanation for what that was. My dad moved into a house in the middle of the woods about two years ago, and I moved in with him soon after to help him get around and take care of the house and whatnot. Side note, it's an old house on land that has a deep Native American history in the South. Honestly, this house is really weird. The first night I spent here, I was woken up by a woman whispering, is anyone home? Right next to me as I was about to fall asleep. My dad didn't believe me when I told him the next day. It's taken a while to get used to living in the deep woods, but something about this property is just off. There have been more than a few times where I've actually felt a heavy presence, almost like someone is standing right behind me. I have a cat who I rely on to alert me when there's someone approaching my room, and there have been times where he's alerted me but nobody was there. Other times, he stares at the same corner of my room with an expression that tells me he can see something I can't. There have been more times I can count where I'll be leaving a room and a cabinet will slam, where it sounds like something was moved behind me. It sounds silly, but it's odd enough for me to notice. I've mentioned it to my father, but he didn't think much of it. Until early this morning. He woke up and went downstairs to find the basement flooded. Somehow, the shower in the basement was turned on and the drain had been clogged. Neither of us used the shower in the basement. He's now fully convinced that there's a ghost in the house. I don't know. If you ask me, I think it's more than the house. I get that feeling even when I'm out on a hike. I always leave food scraps and leftovers out on the tree line for the animals and sometimes coincidentally find little treasures in the same spot, almost like I made a trade with Mother Nature. Once I left strawberry cake leftovers out, and the next day I found a stone with a pink crystal formation. Another time I found an arrowhead carved out of stone. It's really interesting, and I just thought I'd share. I live with my parents in a house built in the 1890s. We moved here around eight years ago, and there have been creepy things going on almost every week since we got here. A cousin of mine said she saw a little girl in a white dress stare at her from behind a corner. Things have been moving around seemingly by themselves, and I often hear the faint sound of two people talking during the night, almost as if a TV is turned on downstairs, but it's always off. Yesterday, I was at home alone, sitting in my room studying. As you sometimes have to do, I passed a little wind. And right after that, I heard what sounded like a little girl giggling in my closet for three or four seconds. I should add that it sounded like she forced herself to stay quiet. 
Regardless, there were no children, and it really frightened me. Like I said, I was home alone. No computers or TVs were turned on at the moment. I went outside to take a walk until my parents came home. I've come here because where I am right now, it's four in the morning, and the only person I know awake doesn't believe me. My cat was crying at me, like she usually does when she's hungry. So I took her downstairs to get her something to eat. But on the way back upstairs, I looked into my living room, and I swear in the top left corner of the door frame, there was this white face that looked straight at me and then moved behind the wall where I couldn't see it. I practically fell over on my way back upstairs, scared out of my mind. I called a friend who responded with, I didn't ask. I'm still sitting in my room with the light on. Nothing like this has happened before, and I'm quite frankly terrified. Like, what do I do? I'm usually quite skeptical when it comes to things like this, but... I can't deny what just happened. To be honest, I think I'm just telling you out of the stress, and I needed someone to acknowledge what just happened to me. What on earth do I do?